I'd like to call to order the special formal meeting of Iowa City City Council, March the 12th, 2019. Roll call, please. Cole. Here. Mims. Here. Sully. Taylor. Present by conference call. Teague. Here. Thomas. Here. Throgmorton. Here. So for the benefit of people watching on TV or here in the audience, I'd like to note that Mazahir Saleh cannot be with us. She is in Tunisia right now uh, upon invitation uh, to participate in some significant event there. So we're very proud of Mazahir being given that offer. All right. I'd also like to note that <clears throat> rumor has it winter might be ending soon. <laughs> I, I don't know what it's doing outside, but you know, is it raining? I don't know. Yeah, raining now. I saw a weather forecast saying that there would be a chance of one to two feet of snow out in the upper Midwest. <laughs> so oh. let's, let's consider ourselves a little bit fortunate. Okay, item two, student leadership awards from Helen Lemmy Elementary. So we have three awardees, Joel Brown, Anora Kauke, and Jolie Loughran. <laughs> so... First names, Joel. Okay, so and Julie. Yeah, yeah all right. We'll start with you, Joel. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> we're very proud of the. Uh, this is not. Doesn't sound like it's on. Okay. Just check that. It is on. Yes. Is it on? Yeah. Now it is. Good deal. Okay, so we can all be very proud of these three students from Helen Lemmy Lemmy School. And. What I typically do is ask you to read your speeches, and then I read the Student Leadership Award, which says exactly the same thing for each of you. It just has your names in your particular awards. So we'll start with Jolie, all right? Okay. Hi, my name is Jolie Lauren. I'm a sixth grader at Lemmy Elementary. I first want to thank my classmates for voting for me. It means a lot to win a leadership award that is voted on by my classmates. I also want to thank you for having me here. I have been, been a member of K-Kids, Safety Patrol, and Student Council at Lemmy. I also play volleyball and softball. I believe that a leader can mean several things, and how you can become one can also be different. I think my class chose me because I am kind to everyone. I help out when I can with students, kindergartners through sixth graders, as well as my teachers. To me, being a leader is being respectful, trusted, and empathetic to others, even when I do not agree with them. I know that respect is very important, so I try to respect everyone's ideas and feelings. I try to be a good role model so I can be a good leader. Thank Thank you. All right. <laughs> See our terrific city clerk turn the volume on the microphone up. Thanks for doing that, Kelly. All right. All right, Joel, you're next. Hello, my name is Joel Brown. I would first like to say how honored I am to be to have been chosen for this award. This means so much to me. I feel like why I was chosen for this award is that when we have indoor recess or other times, we may not be supervised, but I continue to be quiet and act as if there is a teacher in the room. I feel like I have also been able to help many people in math and other subjects, and I have also tried to be my best to be kind and not leave anyone out. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, so math can be really rough, can it? So the fact that you're helping other kids learn math, that's great. Bravo. I took three semesters of calculus in college, and in my fourth semester, I withdrew passing. <laughs> okay, Anora, you're next. 
Hi, my name is Anora Klauke. I'm a sixth grader at Lemmy Elementary, and I'm honored to be picked for the annual leadership award. To me, leadership means someone is respectful, responsible, caring, and a trusting friend to everyone, even if they aren't specifically their best friend. It doesn't matter who, but a leader delivers everyone the same undivided respect. They work hard with everyone. Then again, a leader doesn't have to be any perfect being. A leader doesn't need to be the smartest in the class, but they need to be willing to learn. A leader doesn't need to be the most popular either, but they need to be willing to meet new people. They will fix their mistakes appropriately when they make them, because a leader will never be perfect, but they will try their best to be as good as they can. That's why anyone can be a leader. It just takes a bit more work, but a lot pays off. That's why I want to say thank you to any leader out there who works hard every day to make some sort of change or positive impact. And thank you anyone to anyone for finding me fit to be a leader among my peers. It's been great being here, and thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. Done. You know, it's amazing how a good leader could can be good at one thing and not so good at another, and then some other person could be a great leader in one thing but not in another, and leadership's dispersed in that sense, so bravo. Okay, beautiful speeches, all of you. So let me read the leadership award for you. And again, it's, it's identical for each of you. Student Leadership Award. For your outstanding qualities of leadership within Helen Lemmy Elementary, as well as the community, and for your sense of responsibility and helpfulness to others, we recognize the three of you as an outstanding student leader. Your community is proud of you. Presented by the Iowa City City Council, March 2019. So, Anora. Well done. So I know there's some proud parents back there. There's some proud parents over here and some proud. Where's the other set of proud parents? I know they're out there. Just for the heck of it, raise your hands. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. You have wonderful kids. Okay. Thank Thanks to all of you. So. Okay, item three is proclamations, and there are three proclamations to read tonight. The first is Special Olympics Month. So Joyce, I guess you're going to accept this proclamation? I am. Our athletes are busy getting ready for their what? competition this weekend. So we're not going to see them? We aren't tonight. Oh, I'm no. sorry. Well, let me read the proclamation. And Thank then you. You can speak, right? So. Whereas Special Olympians have a strong desire to compete and win, and whereas Special Olympians know that bravery is measured in setting goals and attempting to reach them, and whereas Special Olympians recognize the joy, pride, and self-worth, humility, and disappointment inherent in organized competition, and whereas Special Olympians appreciate the benefits that healthy competition and physical activity can bring, and whereas Special Olympians give the entire community a chance to gather and share in their spirit of accomplishment, now therefore I, James A. Throgmorton, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2019 to be Special Olympics Month in the City of Iowa City and urge all citizens to commend and support the activities of the Special Olympics. Thank you so much. Brad Barker, who is the Iowa City Park and Rec Superintendent, would like to accept this on behalf of our athletes. Sure. Um, Fifty years ago, Eunice Shriver started Special Olympics. We, have, we serve over 14,000 athletes and unified partners in the state of Iowa. Our competition this weekend, I take great pride in and feel very special that we are the only competition that once our athletes arrive in Iowa City, they have no expenses. We have a banquet for them on Friday night. We have breakfast for them on Saturday morning and a lunch for them on Saturday. Um, it's through our fundraising efforts, which is the Polar Plunge, which I invite you guys to every year, but nobody showed up yet. Um, March 30th of this month, 
we will be having our polar plunge at the, re at the reservoir. And Tim Dwight is once again our celebrity plunger, and Tim always makes it uh, real. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> Tim is Tim. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, we also have another fundraiser, which Iowa Football helps us with, and that is June 28th, and it's at the Brown Deer Golf Course. But through our Polar Plunge and our golf tournament, we are able to raise enough funds to <clears throat> fully fund this event, and it takes between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars. So we take a lot of pride in the fact that we are able to do that. Um, we also wanted to thank the council for once again making it Special Olympics Month. Since we don't have our athletes here, I was wondering if I could read quickly. We have a new thing that we started last November. Special Olympics is starting a new program. It's called the Inclusion Revolution. And if you look online or anywhere, you can find it. But it's a pledge that everyone takes to look forward, to look for the lonely, the isolated, the left out, the challenged, the bullies. I pledge to overcome the fear of difference and replace it with the power of inclusion. I choose to include. Thank you so much. And if you wouldn't mind, and if the audience would like to, we would like to have the Special Olympics Oath. I gave everybody sure. a little sheet up there. Mm -hmm. And if you just repeat after us. Let me win. Let, Let me, me win. win. But if I cannot win. But if, if I, I cannot, cannot win. I cannot. Let me be brave in the attempt. Let me, Let me be brave, brave in the attempt. And our athletes will all be doing that this weekend where our competition is at the Field House, City High, West High, and ProFit Jim and uh, Corville has taken on our power lifters. Um, it's a great thing. We have over 1,100 athletes competing this weekend, so come on out, join us, and again, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Joyce. Okay, our next proclamation has to do with National Service Recognition Day. Yes. Yeah. So let me read this. Yeah. Whereas service to others is a hallmark of the American character and central to how we meet our challenges, and whereas AmeriCorps participants address the more pressing challenges facing our communities, from educating for jobs of the 21st century and supporting veterans and military families, to providing health services and helping communities recover from natural disasters. And whereas AmeriCorps participants serve more than 70,000 locations across the country, including here in Iowa City, bolstering local organizations that are so vital to our economic and social well-being, and whereas national service represents a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solutions and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community impact and increase the return on taxpayer dollars, and whereas the Corporation for National and Community Service shares a priority with mayors, city leaders, county officials, and tribal leaders nationwide to engage citizens, improve lives, and strengthen communities and is joining with the National League of Cities, City of Service, and officials across the country to recognize the impact of service on the Day of Recognition for National Service on April the 2nd, 2019. Now, therefore, I, James A. Throgmorton, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim April the 2nd, 2019 to be National Service Recognition Day in the City of Iowa City and encourage residents to recognize the positive impact of national service in our city and thank those who serve and to find ways to give back to their communities. Well said, thank you. Are you Kayla? I am Kaylee, yes. Yes, I'm Kaylee Horde. I'm the Community Engagement Manager and VISTA Program Supervisor at Shelter House in Iowa City. Um, so we want to thank the Council for recognizing April 2nd as National Service Recognition Day in honor of contributions of the AmeriCorps VISTA Program in Iowa City, Johnson County, and uh, across the United States. Um, so AmeriCorps VISTA is a national service program whose goal is to eliminate poverty. Um, they've been around since 1965 and have had 180,000 members serve since that time. Um, and 
AmeriCorps is a program of CNCS, which is a federal agency that focuses on strengthening communities, improving lives, fostering civic engagement through service and volunteering. VISTA members focus on community empowerment, sustainable solutions, expanding community partnerships, and building capacity to address specific local needs. Our VISTA members have made a significant impact within our agency, but also throughout the entire community. Um, we value the work that they do every day to expand opportunities for our most vulnerable neighbors and foster a community where all residents are able to thrive. Um, so I want to take a moment to and recognize our current serving VISTAs, um, Alex Linden, Haley Franzen, and Mackenzie Fields. Um, so they are currently serving a, a year at Shelter House um, to build capacity within our agency, but like I said, also within our community with the overall goal of eliminating poverty. Um, so I just want to give a special hand for, for their work. Um, and I just wanted to, um, again, invite you all to attend the Shelter House book sale and um, work our coffee shop, which I think Alex might have emailed you all about, so I didn't want to waste an opportunity to mention that as well. Um, but otherwise, that's kind of all we wanted to say. What? No polar plunge? Mm. No. <laughs> that's next year, maybe. Yeah, but no. <laughs> Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you so, very much. Yes. Come get this. Thank you. All right, one more proclamation. <laughs> this going to all come up together. That way you can get rid of all of us. <laughs> so uh, hold on. Uh, this is a lengthy proclamation, as you know. Whereas the accomplishments and achievements of women were first recognized in 1977 by beginning the annual commemoration of International Women's Day and later in 1987 by doing the same for Women's History Month, and whereas since our nation's first non-indigenous settlers arrived, women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic and monumental contributions to the growth and strength of the U.S. in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. And whereas women have shaped and continue to fill critical economics, cultural, and social roles in every aspect of life and provide more than half of our nation's workforce, and whereas women have played unique roles throughout the history of the United States by providing the majority of the volunteer labor force and by helping to establish early charitable, philanthropic, and cultural institutions, and whereas women are now recognized for their essential contributions in the fields of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, law, medicine, social sciences, humanities, and the arts, and whereas women have served our country courageously in the military and have aided our nation in every conflict and war and have continuously worked to advance peace throughout the world to create a more fair and just society for all, and whereas women have served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive movement, securing suffrage, advancing the abolitionist movement, emancipation movement, industrial labor movement, the civil rights movement, equal rights movements, social justice movements, women's health rights, fair housing, equal wage, I'm sorry, equal wage, and opportunity movements. And whereas throughout history, women have driven humanity forward on the path to a more equal and just society, contributing in innumerable ways to our character and progress as a people, both nationally and internationally. Now, therefore, I, James A. Throgmorton, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim March the 8th as International Women's Day and the month of March 2019 to be recognized as Women's History Month. <laughs> I'm Cindy Conger. I'm co-president of the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, along with Kathy Eisenhofer. Polly Horton is also a member. She's back there, the cheerleader, mm. apparently. <laughs> On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, 100 grannies, and the Iowa Women's Foundation, 
represented by Don Oliver. We thank the city of Iowa City for his proclamation of Women's History Month. The League of Women Voters, founded in 1920 by the leaders of the women's suffrage movement, encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Membership in the League is open to all women and men. Voting members must be persons age 16 or older. Our goal, to empower citizens to shape better communities. I think Iowa City is one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you would like to say, Don, Don would you like? Yeah. Thank you. Just a quick. On behalf of the Iowa Women's Foundation, thank you so much for this proclamation. The Iowa Women's Foundation is the only statewide organization that is working to improve the lives of women and girls through economic self-sufficiency. Because we believe when women are successful, their families are and successful and ultimately their communities. Women's History Month is an opportunity for all of us to remember the differences women have made for each other over the years, the battles that they have had to fight, and their hard-won successes. We need to support each other, um, recognize the talent and value we each bring to society, and we need to work together. We are stronger when we work together. Thank you. And representing Hunter Grant. Thank you for this proclamation. Um, the 100 grannies have been around, we will be celebrating our eighth anniversary um, next month. And so we would just like to um, thank the community for allowing us to continue to educate, advocate, and agitate for a cleaner climate for our future generations. Thank you. Bravo. Are you going to speak too? No, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Okay, let's turn to items four through nine, which constitute the consent calendar. I'd like to get a motion to approve the consent calendar as amended, which involves removing item 7.1 for se separate consideration. Could I have a motion for that, please? So moved. Second. second. Uh, moved by Mem, seconded by Cole. Discussion. I want to mention that two items added to the consent calendar involve setting public hearings for April the 2nd. Both involve a, a large proposed development just off North Dubuque up by Interstate 80. One is a comprehensive plan amendment and the other is a proposed rezoning for the area covered by that amendment. So uh, people who are interested in that project will surely want to know that the public hearings are being scheduled. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Taylor? Pauline? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. All right, let's see, that would lead us to, what is that? It's on the next page, Jim. Yeah, I've got, oh, we have to treat item seven one separately, right? Okay, I, seven I, I mean. Is that right? We're treating item 7i separately. It's being deferred. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So item 7i, Tegler Second Subdivision Final Plat. This is a resolution approving the final plat of Tegler Second Subdivision. The applicant has requested deferral to April the 2nd, and there's correspondence associated with that. So, so moved. Moved by Mims. Second. Second by Teague. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Just a motion. Voice vote. Oh, so all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Item 10, community comment. So this is a period when anybody who uh, wants to address a topic that's <clears throat> not on the formal meeting, sorry, not on the formal meeting agenda can come up and speak to us about whatever that topic is that's on their mind. 
please state your name when you come up, like Bob Elliott's going to do in just a second, and and then uh, take not more than five minutes to say whatever's on your mind. Hi, Bob. Good evening. Good evening. I would like to think I might do half as well as the elementary students who preceded me, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. I'm here to talk about road diet, and uh, I don't like what's going on, but I want to make clear that the staff, apparently the, those working with streets and engineering, any time I have communicated with them, they have been very helpful, very polite, very professional. So just because you don't agree with somebody doesn't mean they aren't good people. I hope they feel the same way about me. Um, the city, a few years ago, spent several million dollars putting up a viaduct for the railroad tracks crossing First Avenue in Southeast Iowa City. We love that. It's very well done. It, uh, it moves traffic along, and uh, it, it, it just was a good project. Unfortunately, that was at least partially negated when the city spent another million or so introducing road diet to the uh, First Avenue in Southeast Iowa City. Uh, my wife and I have lived in Iowa City for more than 50 years. Uh, all of that time in southeast Iowa City. I drive First Avenue, that part of it, multiple times a day. And every time I get even further irritated by a city that is one of the two fastest growing largest communities in the state has decided to change four lanes of traffic to basically two lanes and a turning lane. I have seen times when uh, the backup extends from Lower Muscatine by the, uh, by the mall to a quarter mile to a half mile ahead to Muscatine Avenue. And there are times when people turning from one street to get on to First Avenue can't because of the tie-up. Uh, apparently, it was done to uh, reduce the number of accidents as a person who drives that part of First Avenue multiple times a day, I don't see the difference. The only thing I see is people getting irritated by the traffic. Uh, my friend Daryl Hansen has sent a letter uh, wondering what kind of um, cost-benefit ratio the city has used in determining that what was done is worth the cost, the time, the irritation, and the pretty much uh, partially eliminating the benefit of having the underpass for the trains to go over there. Uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about any studies that the state or the city have done, and I wonder, have they been done? The, the busy time is not just when work is out, the usual drive time in most cities, but with traffic for City High, for Robert Lucas, for Southeast, that is a merging of traffic on First Avenue in that area that is really something. Uh, the city, the data I have, I looked it up online, and I apologize because I haven't had a chance to um, make sure of the accuracy, but I have, I have checked it before and it's been pretty good. On the other hand, I know when you take something online, uh, you have to question it. But as one of the two fastest growing metro areas in the state, I just wanted to point out that in the 1990 census, the metro area had more than 73,000. 2000 census, 83,000. 2010 census, 102,000. Uh, for the one of the fastest growing metro areas in the state, I would hope that our city staff who deal with our streets, the traffic, the accidents, the moving of traffic, which the city is responsible for being able to move traffic in a very reasonable and productive manner, Safety is important also. Uh, I hope that the staff 
and the city council and the city manager will not only review before what is happening with another street on another part of town, but looks at what is happening, what has happened to the traffic on First Avenue and continue taking studies of how that traffic moves, the quality of the movement and the quality of the safety on that. I would appreciate if you'd do that and thank you very much for allowing me to uh, perhaps embarrass myself, but I do that all the time so that shouldn't worry you. Thanks again. Thank you, Bob. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kyle Vogel. I'm uh, here, I, I live over on the uh, southwest side by, on Abbey Lane by Rotary Park. I'm actually here on behalf of Keystone Property Management. Um, I'm here really just to share my concerns, share my unhappiness, share some trepidation and hope for maybe changes in the future in regards to um, snow and ice removal, citation, and um, city municipal infraction citations uh, posted and how that policy is currently in place. Um, the situation we have is we manage a property for uh, uh, owners who own a property at 1409 East Court Street. Uh, we two, uh, two young adults that rent that property. They are responsible as per the Iowa City Acknowledgement and Disclosure Form that's attached to the lease uh, and per the lease itself for snow and ice removal at that property. In November, late November last year, we did receive a note from code ordinance, uh, code enforcement from Jan and Stan that they had not cleared the walk. <laughs> They had 24 hours to do it. We contacted the tenants, they took care of it. That was the last thing we heard until last, well, until a week and a half ago when we received a municipal infraction for $250 from the city of Iowa City for four additional code enforcement violations for snow and ice removal. No communications, no email, no quick call, no correspondence of any kind from the city to let us know that the tenants had failed to fulfill both their requirements on the lease and obviously their, their requirements to the city. Um, you know, I, I, we're at the position that obviously, you know, it's valid. Um, as per the ordinances of the city of Iowa City, first violation is a, is a notice, second violation, city just comes out and abates it and you get a $100 administrative fee and the cost of the city crews or the city vendor doing the work. Um, we have not seen any of the bills for that yet, um, which is also of concern to me. I mean, if, if, if when it first happened in January, if we would have gotten a bill a week later saying, hey, the city went out, here's 100 bucks, here's another $200 from the vendor, we would have known there was an issue. We would have known, been able to go to the tenants and say, here's 200 bucks from the city you're going to have to pay. You know, you need to get on your game and make sure this is not a continued occurrence. It didn't happen. So here we are, four additional occurrences, in two in January, two in February. Uh, Stan also informed us that there was also one in March for ICE. Um, I'm at the point, I mean, our clients are gonna go to court, we're gonna discuss it with the judge, but in the end, a $250 fine, municipal infraction fine, a $100 admin fee for five occurrences, and whatever those vendor costs end up being, I mean, we're looking at a $700 to $1,200 bill that our tenants are gonna have to find a way to pay. Um, I don't feel it's fair. I don't feel it's fair to the tenants as residents of the city. I don't feel it's fair to our clients who, uh, you know, we work with the city on an every day, every week, every month basis um, to ensure our properties and our homes are safe, that they're in accordance with the city, whether that's occupancy or safety and fire, all of that. Um, like I said, I, I know what the ordinance said. I know that the resolution that was passed last year basically gave the power to city staff to put in place whatever policies to make, to put the ordinance in fact. And, and that policy, that particular staff policy is not to make a second call or make a third call, even if it's two months later. Um, I guess I'm just hoping that at some point, hopefully before next winter storms, before this comes up again, that uh, city staff directed by city council can find a way to ensure that a simple mode of communication goes out. Um, I do know that when code enforcement is out, they have to come back and put a work order in the system for the vendor. 
There's no reason why when that email is, that work order is emailed to the vendor, that cannot be copied to the property manager or owner on file on the rental permit in the system. I mean, I, I get an email every time there's a job opening in Iowa City or every time there's a bridge closed. or I mean, I get an email from the city. So I, I know the lines of communication are absolutely in place in the city for for that database to be available. I also know that we get it for all of our other violations. If Jan is out and, and notes uh, a nuisance ordinance, you know, we get that for all others. For some reason, snow and ice, it's not a requirement. And I, and I know it's 12,000, I think the number is 12,000 complaints over a four month period. I understand it's overwhelming and I can't even imagine what Stan's crew and what Stan's staff has, uh, been dealing with over the last two months, but at the same time, that shouldn't come at the cost of the citizens and the property owners and the tenants of the town to have to make up for problems that, you know, that obviously the tenants probably knew exist or didn't realize were as bad as they were. Um, but yeah, so I'm just here kind of to put that bug in your ear and hope that maybe before the next time comes around, we can work out a way to, I guess, to ensure that, that tenants aren't paying Ten, you know, thousand, eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollars um, for mistakes that yep. they could have remedied the first time around. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah. So, do we have your contact information? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought <laughs> we did. Uh, so, there's no need to ask Simon wherever he is to get it from you. Oh. Right. Yeah, stand, stand I, uh, we can check to see so. if there's been any slip up, uh, but otherwise, you know. No, there's no no slip up. He he just. I think he described it appropriately. We notify upon first violation. I think that notification says this will be your last notification. The city will, from here on forward, clear it if there's other violations, and you'll be charged accordingly. Thanks. Thanks thank for, you for service. Thank you. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. It. Anyone else? Good evening. Hi. You don't know me because I haven't been here before. I'm James Castagno. I live at 438 Lexington Avenue here in Iowa City. And I got here a couple of minutes too late to put my thing on the sign-in sheet. Is that okay? Or? Oh, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just sign your name. name. Just sign your name there. Oh, okay. James, you said your last name's Castanga? Castagno, C-A-S-T-A-G-N-O. <coughs> Castagno, if you want to say it the other way. I said, I'll just, I fill this out. I'll yep, just, just stick it on there. Okay, just a couple things that I wanted to talk about. And uh, one is, uh, and maybe I'm going over plowed ground here, I'm sure I am. I came to a meeting a few months ago, it was a working session about the deer problem and heard people speak on both sides of that. And I don't know where we are in culling the deer, but they need to be culled. I honestly believe that. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, we have, I think I counted 11 just uh, in my neighbor's yards when I start, started out to come here tonight. And uh, this has been a really hard winter on them because of the ice that sealed up the ground before the snow came down. And I think some of them are really starving or almost starving. <coughs> and uh, the result is they're eating everything in sight, the use, the lower bud branches on the trees and everything. And uh, you know, I feel sorry for them. I mean, I feel like throwing them a bale of hay or something like that, you know, to feed them just so they don't, you know, suffer. But on the other hand, I think some of them do need to be culled just to, because we have, the, the situation is we have to take the place of the predators. You know, back in 1492, before the first Europeans landed in this side of the world, uh, the deer had uh, gray wolves, they had uh, mountain lions, and most of all, they had Native Americans acting as predators of them. I mean, the deer were the Native Americans used them for meat, for shelter, for clothing, for everything. And all those are gone now, and we and consequently we're the only predators left. But we aren't predating as we should, I guess, is, is kind of what I'm saying. And in the meantime, we're serving them up a smorgasbord of succulent plants to eat, you know, and there are way more. I mean, if you took the square miles in Iowa City, there are way more deer in those square miles than there ever were when only the Native Americans were on this continent. I would bet you on that if that could be proved. And and I've, I've read things online that say that we have at least as many white-tailed deer in this country now as we had when the first Europeans arrived, maybe two or three times more. You know, so I just think there's no choice but to but to do something about this because they're eating everything in sight this year because they can't get to anything else, and it just shows 
what the problem is. So I, I would argue that we do need to go ahead. I, I'm just here in support of some kind of a deer culling program, even though I like, the, I like to see the deer out there too, and I kind of enjoy a few of them, but not maybe a whole herd. Anyway, enough of that. The, the other thing that I uh, wanted to talk about is the condition of the streets. And I know that we've had a really terrible winter for the condition of the streets, but my feeling is that the streets were not in very good shape before this winter, and they were sort of set up for what we're seeing now. And uh, I, I, I looked at the budget, and I don't know if I'm reading it correctly, but there, what do we spend, about $3.6 million on the streets department or something out of a $290 million budget? And I would like to see us maybe take a million somewhere out of somewhere else in the budget, you know, some of these nice but not necessary things we do, and do a better job of maintaining the streets. I called Ron Kanaki about a year ago and said, Park Road is in terrible shape. You come out every two or three months and patch six to 12 potholes and then two or three months later you come out and patch another six to twelve and it's just a mass of patches now go on park and he said well it's not in the budget this year maybe it'll be in the budget next year he's a nice guy I don't have any problem with him but there but it was what I'm saying is the roads weren't in good shape so then you get a winter like this and it really comes home to roost how bad a shape they were in James if, if you could wrap it up then. okay I will and then but I, I will just say this I would challenge the council to go out and drive on Park Road at the corner of Park and Furson streets if you haven't been there it's it is amazing. a mass of potholes and even big Chevy Suburban slow down to about two miles an hour to plow their way through there it's just awful and we need to I mean the function of a government, one of the basic functions, is just maintain the streets. That's not nice but necessary. It's necessary. Great. Thank you. Thank you, James. You're spot on about both of those topics. We had extensive discussion about the deer management issue. We feel kind of trapped because the state, what's the name of the National, the Natural Resources Commission, has told us we have to do sharpshooting. They'll permit sharpshooting during the first year, and then after that we have to do bow hunting for the next four years. That, that's the signal that we've gotten from them. So we're being told we can't do what we want to do, and we have to do what the overwhelming majority of the city does not want us to do, namely bow hunting. So there's a problem. Potholes. I was on at Park Avenue or Park, Park Road at that intersection. It's horrible, absolutely horrible. You're exactly right, horrible potholes. We know this. It's, it's spring, they're coming up like crocuses. Mm. So you're drawing attention to a really important topic, James. That's all I'm trying to say, sorry. Yes, Matt, hi. Hi, hi uh, my name is Matt Krieger. Uh, Ingrid Anderson. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, and we are co-chairs of the Iowa City Climate Action Advisory Board. Uh, six months ago, this council adopted the Iowa City Climate Action Plan, and at that time, the steering committee that helped form that plan then was disbanded because its um, its purpose had had been achieved to help develop that plan. And so, the members uh, of that steering committee uh, formed a uh, self-governing, um, self-operating uh, citizens committee uh, board to help and assist the city with implementation of that plan. And so, over the the last um, six months, uh, we've been busy trying to figure out how we operate and how we how we do this tremendous task. <laughs> I was just looking at your strategic plan and the seven goals that are up there, and while environmental sustainability is number six, we actually impact all of them. And so uh, the breadth of this effort is enormous. Um, and so. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is, is strategically figure out how to address it um, while also meeting the intent and items within the climate action plan. So over the past six months, uh, we have formed, uh, we have three fo main focus areas, um, and so we have thus formed working groups around those areas made up of the board members and other members in our community. Uh, those are focused on the buildings working group, so focusing on energy efficiency in the building stock, both, both residential and commercial. The transportation working group, um, tasked with developing programs and assisting with community-wide sustainability transportation opportunities. Uh, the communications working group, which helps support all other efforts, um, but also works to uh, educate, provide public awareness, outreach to the community. 
uh, and then also the equity working group was formed in order to better understand the impact that specific programs and initiatives that were being undertaken were impacting the different populations within our community. So, um, so we're busy at work. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is just a, a call to action um, in our community to join us in this effort and our working groups. Um, and so uh, they, uh, if anyone is interested in doing that, they are certainly welcome to contact uh, Brenda Nations at the City of Iowa City. That'll be the easiest way to get through to us. Um, and she's been, uh, uh, she's uh, working on the city's uh, efforts on that side of the plant as well. So. That was it. Um, within your within your packet, then was our quarterly update. Uh, our intent is to uh, provide that update on an ongoing basis um, uh, for the immediate and ongoing future. Great. Thanks for the work you're doing. Yeah. I would just mention one quick little thing in your update, and thank you very much. It was very helpful. Under the working group, I think you have your date wrong. It says in November 2019. That's correct. It'd be two, November 2018. <laughs> <laughs> right, but didn't you form them last November? In 2018. Yeah. That's correct. So should it say 2000 November 2018 instead? That's correct. Of, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? No one else? Okay, we'll turn to item 11, planning and zoning matters. Item 11A, rezoning 2130 Muscatine Avenue. This is an ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 0 0.155 acres of property located at 2130 Muscatine Avenue from community commercial CC2 to high density single family <coughs> residential RS12. I'll open the public hearing. Anybody want to address this topic? All right, seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I have a motion for first consideration? So moved. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Teague. Discussion. I, I would like to say that we uh, offered to consult with the Planning and Zoning Commission because they had voted 3-3 to recommend denial of the proposed ordinance. And in our last meeting, we a majority of us indicated that a majority wanted to approve the ordinance. So we consulted with them earlier during our work session, had a very fruitful dialogue with them, and I think we're in a good position to make a decision now. Okay, so discussion. I just wanted to briefly highlight that I am going to support rezoning this. You know, one of the things that came up during our work session is this question of, um, I actually like community commercial. Um, I think our neighborhood commercial, although it's technically a slightly different designation, but to have commercial spaces in relative proximity to our residential neighborhoods is extremely important. However, in this particular case, um, it is very difficult if you want to do new construction uh, to fully utilize that commercial um, aspect to this project. Uh, especially considering the parking requirement. Uh, so for that reason, I, I think that this uh, does make sense to rezone to um, single-family residential RS-12. Any further discussion? Well, I'm going to support the rezoning as well. It seems to me, given our conversation with the commission, uh, it's the right thing to do. Hearing no further discussion, roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion carries 6 to 0. Item 11B, rezoning at the northwest corner of Moss Ridge Road and Highway 1. This is an ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 3.2 acres of property located at the northwest corner of Moss Ridge, Moss Ridge Road, and Highway 1 from Interim Development Research Park, IDRP, to Highway Commercial, CH1. Could I have a motion to pass and adopt, please? So move. Second. Moved by Teague, seconded by Thomas. Discussion. 
Hearing none, roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Frog Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 11C, rezoning east of South Gilbert and west of Sandusky Drive. This is an ordinance conditionally rezoning approximately 18.03 acres of property located east of South Gilbert Street and west of Sandusky Drive from interim development multifamily residential IDRM zone to plan development overlay low density single family residential OPDRS5 zone plan development overlay low density <coughs> multifamily residential OPDRM12 zone and plan development overlay neighborhood public OPD P1 zone. Could I have a motion to pass and adopt, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, second by Mims. Discussion. Hearing none, roll call, please. Rob Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 11D, Cherry Creek Subdivision, Preliminary Plat. This is a resolution approving a preliminary plat of Cherry Creek, Iowa City, Iowa. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Teague. Discussion. We don't need any staff presentation about this, do we? No, I wouldn't think so either. Okay. Uh, any discussion? No. Hearing none, roll call, please. Uh, Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throckmorton? Yes. Motion carries 6 to 0. Item 11E, Pigeon Timber 2nd Edition Preliminary and Final Plat. This is a resolution approving a preliminary and final plat of Pigeon Timber 2nd Edition, a subdivision of Lot 2 of Pigeon Timber, could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Move. Second. Moved by Teague, seconded by Mims. Discussion. Danielle. Good evening, Mayor. Danielle Sisman, NDS. I'll just give a brief presentation on this one. The item before you tonight is the proposed preliminary and final plat for Pigeon Timber 2nd Edition. The property is located off of Tree Farm Lane Northeast, approximately a quarter or half mile east of Prairie du Chien Road in unincorporated Johnson County. Uh, the application is to re is requesting to resubdivide one lot into th uh, three new lots, approximately one acres in size, for future single-family housing. The subject area is located in the Iowa City Johnson County Fringe Area A North Corridor and about one mile outside of the city's projected growth area. Any infrastructure improvements within this uh, designation must meet the city's rural design standards as outlined in our Fringe Area Agreement with the county and be approved simultaneously by both the city and Johnson County. Staff has reviews, reviewed the proposed design and finds the proposed platting to be consistent with the comprehensive plan and Fringe Area Agreement. Um, with respect to environmentally sensitive areas, um, subdivisions in the county are required to conform to the county's regulations pertaining to sensitive areas, and they have a uh, proposed plan to do so. They will also be in the county and on county uh, services, so they will be on a well and septic system as um, the county does allow that. Um, as far as next steps, the preliminary and final plat must be approved uh, by Iowa City Council before Johnson County Board of Supervisors can take their final action. Uh, their county's planning board and our planning and zoning commission have all, both reviewed this uh, application uh, after it leaves uh, the proceedings here tonight and the Board of County Supervisors, they'll be on to the development stages of this subdiv subdivision. Um, based on the, an analysis of the proposed project against the policies outlined in the fringe area agreement, which is part of our city comprehensive plan, staff recommended approval of the application to the Planning and Zoning Commission with one condition regarding the normal subdivision drawings and legal paperwork. And at its February 21st meeting, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, did vote 7 to 0 to recommend approval to you tonight. That concludes staff report. Thank you, Danielle. Any questions for Danielle? Thank you. All right, uh, so any council discussion? <laughs> it's pretty funny. From my point of view, it's pretty funny. I look at down there, 
give me the same kind of look. What? <laughs> Okay, not hearing any discussion. Okay, roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? No. Motion carries 5 to 1. Pauline, I would have said something about your facial expression, but I oh. can't speak. <laughs> it was the same, probably. <laughs> okay, item 12, $410,000 general obligation bonds. This is a resolution instituting proceedings to take additional action for the issuance of not to exceed $410,000 general obligation bonds. I'm going to open the public hearing. Dennis, good evening. Oh, good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Dennis Bockenstead, the finance director for the state of Iowa City. Uh, tonight on the City Council agenda, there's a series of hearings and resolutions uh, to initiate the proceedings for the 2019 general obligation bonds, total about $13.24 million. Uh, the following timeline is for the issuance of the GO bonds. Tonight, uh, March 12th, there are four separate public hearings uh, regarding the bonds' purposes under a state law. This is then followed by two additional resolutions. Uh, the first resolution is to levy the necessary property taxes to repay the bonds. And the second is a resolution to direct the sale and to set the bidding procedures for the bonds. Uh, on April 6th, uh, 16th, we have the Moody's bond rating call for, for them. And on May 7th is when we actually receive the bids and open them up and, and compare them. And then on June 4th is when we close on the sale of bonds and receive the proceeds. Uh, the following is a list of the projects that are being funded by the GEO bonds. Uh, those marked with an asterisk uh, are not considered essential purposes. And under state law, uh, each requires a separate public hearing, and that's why there's four uh, public hearings tonight. Uh, those projects that are uh, general purpose and not essential are the rec center ADA improvements, uh, the solar panels at the public works facility, and the Highway 1 sidewalk trail project. Uh, you can see other major projects in there are the uh, Willow Creek Qantas Park improvements, uh, the second half of the pedestrian mall reconstruction, uh, the Lower City Park Adventure Playground, and the McCullister, uh, McCullister Boulevard extension. Uh, to summarize, the 2019 GEO bonds are included in the fiscal year 2019 amended budget in the five-year capital improvement program. Uh, they're incorporated into current and future tax levy projections, and they'll be sold at a competitive bidding process. And on your agenda tonight, items 12 through 17 all pertain to issuance of the bonds. And I will try to answer any questions if you have any. Okay. Any questions from you folks? Nope. Uh, for the public's benefit, I guess I should say this is a routine thing that happens every spring or late late winter. Yes. Uh, after process the, we go through, kind of right after the budget is adopted tonight, it's the same night, a little bit of an anomaly. Uh, we do an annual GL bond issue for street projects, park projects, and other projects that were developed through the capital improvement program. So I remember one of the projects you showed was the extension of McAllister Boulevard. I know a lot of people on the south side of the city are eagerly looking forward to that. It's been planned for quite a long time. And I'm very excited about the um, um, solar panel array on top of the new public works facility that is already under construction, right? The, the facility is? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, and other needed improvements. So I'm eager to vote on all these. So are, uh, do I just marshal this marshal yeah, right? Yeah, uh, that we just, you know, just uh, after each public hearing, there is a resolution uh, to institute proceedings. And then at the end, there's uh, two separate uh, resolutions, one uh, for the pre-levy and the other one to uh, set the bidding procedures and uh, to move forward with the sale of the bonds. And so, yeah, you can just uh, move forward with each hearing and adapt each resolution. And after that, we should be ready to move forward with the sale. Okay, doke. So, would anybody else like to address this topic, which is item 12, $410,000 general obligation bonds? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. 
Could I have a motion to approve, please? Move the resolution. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by Cole. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 13, $700,000 general obligation bonds. This is a resolution instituting proceedings to take additional action for the issuance of not to exceed $700,000 in general obligation bonds. I'll open the public hearing. I see no one uh, wanting to speak. I'll close the public hearing. Move the resolution. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Cole. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 14, $490,000 general obligation bonds. Uh, do I have to repeat this same language over and over again? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, Resi this is a resolution instituting proceedings to take additional actions for the issuance of not to exceed $490,000 general obligation bonds. I'll open the public hearing. Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Move the resolution. Second. Moved by Mem, second by Cole. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 15, $11.8 million general obligation bonds. This is a resolution instituting proceedings to take additional action for the issuance of not to exceed $11.8 million general obligation bonds. I'll open the public hearing. Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Move the resolution. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Cole. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 16, 2019 GO bonds pre-levy authorization. This is a resolution authorizing the issuance of $13.24 million general obligation bonds, series 2019, and levying a tax for the payment thereof. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Cole. Discussion? I would just make one quick comment. Sure. We don't know yet what the interest rates will be, but as we talk multiple times every year, and obviously there'll be a phone call with Moody's on our bond rating, but that AAA bond rating that we've managed to keep for 37 or what years saves us literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on these bonds uh, because of that high uh, rating that we have for Moody's. So be anxious to see this when we get them back. Indeed. So uh, moving on, I, I just did a roll call, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Sorry, I lost track briefly of where we were in that. Item 17, 2019 GO bonds bidding procedure. This is a resolution directing the advertisement for sale of $13.24 million dollar amount subject to change, general obligation bonds, series 2019, and approving electronic bidding procedures. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Thomas. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throckmorton? Yes, motion carries six to zero. Item 18, fiscal year 2019 budget amendment public hearing. This is a resolution amending the fiscal year 2019 operating budget. I'll open the public hearing. Dennis? Hello again. And uh, once again, we have a multi-item presentation. Uh, I'm gonna speak in regards to items uh, 18 through 20 on your agenda tonight. 
they all pertain to the adoption of the city's fiscal year 2019 amended budget and the adoption of the city's fiscal year 2020 proposed budget. Uh, items 18 and 19 are two separate public hearings that are followed by resolutions to adopt. Uh, item 20 is a resolution to adopt the three-year financial plan and the five-year capital improvement program. So I'm gonna cover all three of those in just one presentation. Uh, in December of 2018, uh, the City Council received the fiscal year 2019 amended budget and the fiscal year 22, or 2020 proposed budget in, in the financial plan document that was submitted in December. Uh, over the past two months, the City Council has a series of public meetings, has made some adjustments to those budgets. Uh, those changes have been included in the final budget resolutions uh, under consideration tonight. Uh, I'm going to summarize those changes that we've made over the last uh, two months. Uh, the changes to the FY 2019 amended budget include one, uh, there was the addition of a developer contribution of $73,450 for public art that was received. Uh, there was a reallocation of water fund expenditures for collector well pump repairs, and this was no net change uh, in expenditures in the budget. Uh, there was an affordable housing fee in lieu of payment that was received that we incorporated into the budget for just over $400,000. Uh, there was a facility master plan reserve transfer, which was reduced <coughs> by $500,000 to $2 million. And there was a $10,000 contribution to the shelter house that was added, and this was offset with an allocation from the general fund contingency. Uh, changes to the 2020 proposed budget that were made over the last couple of months. Um, we finalized the tax calculations from the budget forms, and so there was an increase in the final revenue. Uh, primarily, this was gas and electric taxes and property tax backfill payments, um, all combined to amount to a little over $210,000 that was spread across four separate funds. Um, the second item, uh, the public art budget was increased by $25,000. Uh, there was an offsetting reduction to this to the building change program, uh, so there was a net zero. A solar project at Terry Trueblood was added uh, for $100,000. Uh, the so a South District Home Ownership Program was added for $140,000. And the affordable housing fund uh, transfer from the general fund was increased by $350,000 to a million dollars. In addition to that, the eight agencies' funds were increased to $251,500. Uh, in conclusion, uh, items 18 through 20 on your agenda tonight are for the adoption of the fiscal year 2019 amended budget and the adoption of the fiscal year 2020 proposed budget. Uh, there's two separate public hearings that are followed by resolutions to adopt. There's then a third resolution to adopt the three-year financial plan and the five-year cap improvement program. And finally, the budget must be adopted and filed with the state of Iowa and Johnson County by March 15th. And I will try to answer any questions you have. I do have a question, Dennis. Uh, I wonder if you could help us understand, and when I say us, I mean people in the audience, people watching on TV and so on, help us understand the, the budget amendment process. In other words, we're gonna adopt, presumably, uh, well, we have to by state law, a budget, right. uh, not later than the 15th of this month. Uh, and then it's possible to amend the budget during the following year, as I understand it, but there are certain constraints and processes and all that. Can you help us understand that? You please? can amend the budget pretty much at any time. You just have to follow the same process f uh, with which the budget was adopted. So you would set a hearing, uh, you would publish a notice for that hearing, uh, which would outline the changes in, the, in totals, and then you'd hold the hearing and then adopt that certificate, and then you follow that certificate with the, with the county and the state. So it follows a very similar process as to the adoption of the budget. The only difference is, is you cannot recertify taxes for the year once they've been certified, so you cannot make that change in a future budget amendment. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Dennis? I do. On the $140,000 that was added for the South District, is that money coming from the land banking fund? I think I, we added that uh, above and beyond that. Is that I believe we that's what was done. That was part of the reduction of the 500000 that went to the facility plan reserve. 
Yeah, you may be thinking of the Del Rey project when we increased a, a contribution to that project for the offsite sewer improvements. We did take okay. that from the land banking fund. <coughs> okay, for this one, one, it was above and beyond. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Anyone else want to address this particular budget amendment topic? Good evening, Greg. Good evening. Hi, uh, my name is Greg Hearns, uh, president of uh, Iowa City Federation of Labor. Um, approximately a year ago, um, after some conversations with some, I guess, at one time they were referred to as permanent part-time employees um, about their working conditions and some concerns they had about struggling to make ends meet and things like that. So being, labor, being from labor, we were concentrating basically on how we could help these people get benefits. Um, we'd already been working on um, how we could increase their wages, so I think you guys put a plan, a good plan, plan in place to address that. Um, but in our efforts, we understood that there were some uh, concerns from ASME, and ASME was part of this discussion the whole time. Um, but I think we were more concentrated on um, getting the people benefits than we were on addressing these concerns, and I think it's important that these concerns be brought forward. Um, fast forward to January when uh, the council received a letter from ASME, again, um, addressing those concerns, and it was kind of interpreted that ASME wasn't on board. But that's not true, ASME is on board, but there's some apprehension based on the concerns that they've been expressing the whole time. Um, so, you know, we've kind of rethunk this thing and, and feel that we haven't, probably haven't given the council a fair opportunity to assess this, this whole thing as far as uh, the benefits without addressing the concerns first because uh, if you address the benefits without addressing the concerns, the concerns was probably part of the ramifications that were gonna happen um, from these people getting the benefits. Um, so, like I said, ASME is definitely on board, but they're a little apprehensive because of the concerns that we have. So we think the best way to address this now is that our request to the council is that um, you direct staff to sit down with ASME and have a discussion about these concerns and see if we can work these concerns out before we move any further on this. Um, we understand that the budget can be amended. Um, so if we can get this part out of the way first, I think we'll, you know, it'll be a great step ahead uh, moving forward. So like I said, that's our request to the council now to, and understand that this apprehension is based on, you know, some fears, you know, let's be truthful about it. And I think that if we can't address these fears and get these things taken care of, we'll never, we'll never be able to move ahead. So the labor community is uh, willing to be part of these discussions if invited. And, um, you know, we hope we can get this thing worked out. All right, thank you. Great, thanks, Greg. Yep. Would anyone else like to address this topic? Okay, seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So move. Second. Moved by Teague, seconded by Thomas. Discussion. So I'd like to ask Jeff to um, summarize what you understand we directed the staff to do at our January 22nd meeting uh, with regard to handling the hourly um, positions issue. Sure. Well, the, the issue was uh, first surfaced on your January 7th budget work session. That's when the uh, discussion about our temporary employees came up, our temporary employees specifically that work year round. Um, we took the next week to provide you some very high level information on how many of those positions that we have and the best we could at the time, the approximate cost of converting temporary positions into permanent positions. Uh, and that factored in increased wages as well as uh, health benefits. Uh, you gave us direction at the at the January 22nd meeting, and one of the direction, uh, specifically one direction that you gave us was to work with AFSME on this. So, uh, to, you know, the 
uh, summarize, I would say you you said, no, we're not ready for this right now, but you certainly didn't close the door on the discussion. You wanted more information, and that was really our recommendation to you. Um, I see this as a, a very complex issue. Um, it's not as it's not a, a simple matter of just providing budget funds. Um, we have to look uh, in depth at each of these positions analyze those positions, uh, determine um, how the current staffing model is working uh, with their pay and, and what a future staffing model would look like if we converted hourly to temporary employees. Um, so what we um, uh, asked and what you uh, allowed for us to do is to do an in-depth analysis and return to you no later than August of next year before we start the, the next budget process. Um, and at that time, we no later in August of this year, 2019. Of 2019, right? yeah. So we'll return to you no later than August of 2000 and and, uh, and and 19, and give you that comprehensive analysis. We'll have better cost estimates. We'll be able to describe uh, changes in levels levels of service, um, changes in staffing approaches. Um, by the time it gets to you, we will have sat down with AFSME and reviewed all this, so that you'll be able to get um, um, their fully informed. Uh, um, uh, opinions on, on what uh, staff has, has developed. So I think for me, as I hear the discussion happening, it, it's more of a matter of timing. Um, it's going to take us several months to, to pull this information together, I think, in, in a, at, at a level of detail that it really deserves. Um, what I have uh, uh, also communicated to those that have inquired is that uh, you don't necessarily have to wait until the next budget process. If we present this information in August and you want to make immediate changes, you can amend the budget and make those changes immediate so you're not waiting a whole other year until um, July of, of 2020, essentially. You'll have that ability to amend the budget if that's what, you, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, but I really caution you to, to move forward with anything sooner than, than August because we won't be able to produce you that full set of information that I think you, I think you really need. So as you know, after every council meeting, I, I email you and, and the department heads a, a recap and basically summarizing those actions. So you can go back at that, uh, at that email um, and look exactly what that direction was that you gave us and what our marching orders are. And, and I think it would be helpful if I just read that section to you so you know exactly what we're doing. Um, so for this particular item, no changes to hourly positions will be included in the FY20 budget. Human Resources staff will prepare a more in-depth analysis on the positions included in the IP4 of the 117 information packet. The position analysis should include an overview of current responsibilities, current staffing approaches using hourly employees, likely staffing approach utilizing permanent employees, patterns of tenures in those hourly jobs, impacts of the change on other positions and operations, an estimated cost in shifting to permanent employees, and any other pertinent information. Additionally, human resources should survey comparable cities to compare usage of hourly employees and total compensation, total compensation packages offered to such employees. Once complete, the analysis shall be shared and discussed with AFSME leadership. The completion deadline for reporting back to the city manager's office is July 12th. And that's so that our office can review that, uh, take part in any discussions, and make sure it's ready for your um, uh, make sure it's ready for your review in August. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, so, council, any questions for Jeff or Dennis or? So I think Greg um, brought up a good point as far as um, you know. This was brought to council uh, in January, early January, and it really is about um, the nuts and bolts and and getting the information at this point. Personally, I think that it is a major issue uh, that we don't want to rush, um, you know, with the resolution to ensure that we're doing um, the best thing. Everything's been vetted between ASME and staff. Um, one of the fears that I do have along this process is that, you know, um, 
you know, July 12th comes around when Jeff office gets a report, and then in August we're presented with something that we might have concerns about. And so I don't know if there's a any type of a process um, or, or a way to add us in along the way so that um, if there are concerns that um, we can have some input, I'm not exactly sure how this, you know, totally works. Um, I, I, I always find it to be, I know we don't like the time game, but, but we are talking about employees and their jobs and um, we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing and, and taking our time through that process. But I also don't want August to come around and then there's maybe disagreement between um, you know how the city and uh, asked me came to um, agreement and 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 there's some st things still lingering and then council is then you know dealing with something else at that point so is there any way that uh, council can get uh, you know some updates along the way or have an idea of how things are being played out if it's if it's major turnaround within these roles um, I think that's pretty critical that council have some um, knowledge of what's happening, um, you know, within these roles. I get what, maybe I'm hearing something different from Jeff than what it seems like you're hearing from what you're saying, because it's, what I was hearing from Jeff was that that time between now and July is really going to be strictly data gathering and data analysis. Is that well, and, and just some st strategic thinking about our operations. And so I, I give you just a, a very, uh, I think one of the more illustrative cases: uh, our our rec center front desk staff that um, is both at uh, Scanlon, Mercer, and Robert A. Lee. We may have. Uh, 20 to 25 hourly employees that staff that front desk and they work in where uh, this is Pauline. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yes, Pauline. J oh, J um, yes, I think um, Jeff was speaking. Pauline, did you know that? What Jeff was What's speaking? That? Jeff was oh, no, speaking. No, I, I couldn't hear him. Okay. So Jeff, could you speak Sorry, Pauline, I'll speak up. I, I um, so I'm okay. talking about just trying to give an example of the type of analysis that we want to do. And I'm using the rec center front desk staff as, a, as an example. We may have 20 to 25 employees that, that staff those desks. And some may work 10 hours a week. Some may work 15. Some may work 20, 25. And that may vary throughout the year based on you know their schedules. And they may be taking classes and have to vary those schedules. If we look to move those to permanent positions, we're not necessarily going to move 20 people into permanent positions. We may be better off from a service level standpoint of uh, having fewer full-time positions or having all half-time positions. Um, we want to look at the job qualifications uh, uh, of those positions. So if we're going to um, uh, increase pay, say five, six, seven dollars um, an hour, we may want to look at other requirements. Do they have any ex experience in a, in a um, related field? Do they have bilingual skills that could uh, assist and, and strengthen our service levels at those operations? That's the type of analysis that we want to go through, and then we want to present to you here's what it looks like now, here's what it costs now to offer this level of service, and then if we change to permanent staffing, here's what that model may look like. It's not going to be this is the only model that it can look like, but I think as, as, the, as the policymakers, you'll want um, at least our per, per, uh, um, opinions as professional staff to say, this is how we would do it if you moved us to if you moved to a permanent benefited positions, and it may look a little different, and it may um, change the way we operate those types of jobs. That analysis takes some time, and then on top of that, you've asked for how comparable cities handle that. So we've got to do some data gathering um, so that we can give you some comparisons and say, you know, this is how we do it in in Iowa City. Here's how Ames does it, or here's how Madison does it, or whoever else that we may check with. That's just not something that we can pull together in a matter of weeks. And we've got 
a dozen or more positions like that that we have to analyze and, and come back to you. And, and we absolutely want AFSCME's uh, thoughts. Um, if we move these staff members into permanent roles, they're going to be part of the AFSCME union in all likelihood. So we want to make sure that AFSCME's uh, not on their heels reacting to this, that they have every opportunity to study it, to ask questions before it really comes to you so that you can have their informed opinion. And, and I think that's what I was um, referring to. This seems very complex, what Jeff just described, and that's what I heard, and I thought, you know, um, what, I am encouraged that ASME will be a part of this process, of course, but I also wonder if, um, if it wouldn't be a good idea to even include them, in, you know, in general terms before, just in general discussion, um, so that they have an idea of what, you know, the city staff is thinking about, and then their points or, you know, they can share as well what their thoughts are before, you know, s staff is going one way and their thoughts are another way. And then when you come together and share your thoughts, they're very different. And so, I mean, that's that's a part of my concern. Yeah, I'd be very happy to reach out to, to AFSCME and, and schedule a, a, a meeting in which they could express some of their some of their thoughts up front, ask some questions so that we know that going into our analysis. I'm more than happy to do that. Pauline, did yeah, you want to I, say? Yeah, this, this Pauline. Uh, can I talk now? Yeah, go ahead. But I think Bruce made a very good point. This is a very complex issue, which is why we couldn't just make a spur-of-the-moment decision when it was first sprung on us. And I think uh, Jeff has mentioned a couple of times about the uh, current uh, staffing approaches and that it's not just budget issue, but they need to analyze those positions. And, and that's why I think it's extremely important uh, uh, to have AFSCME's involvement in, in making these decisions in this discussion. I think it should weigh very heavily on, on how, what, what the city and eventually the council decides to do with this. I think that accurately reflects my position as well. I mean, I, I think I definitely want to make sure that AFSCME is brought in as an equal partner in this. And I think to Bruce's point, I think what your fear is, is if there are some lingering conflicts, I, I want to make sure that those are being allowed to ventilate directly to us if you're not able to resolve it in terms of how that works. What I don't want to have happen is, is that there are these unresolved conflicts, we get one side, because it is almost a collective bargaining context. We may have to amend that or um, you know, change the city's position as far as that goes. But the way I review view those marching orders is that we've committed to doing this. The question is, is how we do this. That's my that's my take. I am committed to doing it. Um, I think the question is the timing and how it's going to be funded. Um, I think that is at least where I'm coming from, and we'll get the details in August as far as that goes. I wouldn't characterize it that way. Well, that's why I interpret yeah, it, and, but I want to get it done. Yeah, and I, no, I appreciate that. I interpreted it that we gave staff marching orders to do the analysis, and then we would make a decision based upon that analysis. I'm not saying yay, I'm not yeah. saying nay, yeah. but I mean, I'm, I am not going to commit to anything without the data and the analysis um, and hearing what AFSCME has to say, because I think their first... Um, memo back to us was very lukewarm, That's and fair. I think it was because of concerns that they have um, about how it could affect some of their current members and how these new positions would fit in there, and totally, totally legitimate you know, questions and uncertainties that they have at this point in time. So yeah, the only clarification I would say from what you said, Rockney, is I did not feel that the quote marching orders that we gave to staff was that we were going to do this, just give us the data. It was give us the data and then we can discuss it. Because I, I mean, I don't know. We, we may come back and say there's certain ones of these positions that maybe it doesn't make sense. Or AFSCME may come back and say staff said there's 38 but we really think there's 45. And yeah, it's so, the details that they'll come back with a joint right, report. Right, so I'm not willing to commit to any decision until I have facts and data and analysis in front of me. That's, that's all I want to say. And, and, and I think that's...
true for any any council member is that we we have to get the information back um, because it can come back and I may not even like it and can't vote on it and that's why you know I wanted to make sure that there was if there were some disagreements along the way that maybe council needed to maybe you know get involved in that at least we've opened up that door um, because the last thing I want to do is make sure that we, is to get some of the back and then after all you know um, some lengthy time has gone on and then none of us can say yes <laughs> I think they'll probably let us know if there's a road sure I would sure think. sure yeah I think we need to do have make sure staff does some good analysis on this and some good consultation with Ask Me, and uh, my guess is we'll probably modify the uh, what we're doing to some extent. I don't know how much. We'll find out because we need the analysis, we need the consultation, and so on. But I want to also uh, express support for some language that appears in in Greg Hearns's uh, email to us about having a vision for a high road local economy built on good jobs. I mean, I firmly support that. We just don't want to, we want to make sure we don't kind of mess up lives of a whole bunch of other people who are on part-time or certain kinds of hourly uh, situations, yeah. Okay, any further discussion? I, just briefly, I, I like what I'm hearing in terms of the you know, we're asked me working with uh, staff and I'm um, looking forward to the collaboration. Okay, we have a resolution before us. In no further discussion, I'm assuming. Roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 19, fiscal year 2020, budget public hearing. This is a resolution adopting the annual budget for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. I'll open the public hearing. We've already gotten a briefing from Dennis, uh, I don't know, 25 minutes ago or whenever that was. Yeah. I don't see anybody who wants to speak. I'll close the public hearing. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Thomas, seconded by Mims. Discussion. Yeah, I'll start here. Um, I've actually had debated an awful lot in the last couple of weeks whether I was going to support this budget or not. Um, and let me just start by, as I think I normally do, is commending our staff for the incredible, um, incredible amount of work that they do starting easily back in August, if not before. <laughs> Um, you know, we had our meeting in August to, you know, kind of give them direction and any, you know, new items or particularly any large ticket items um, that we wanted to see um, in the budget. And I think that's something that we did the f maybe for the first time this year, and, and Jeff had kind of requested that because I think in past years we've kind of dropped some things on them at the last minute that made it a little more challenging. And so to try and get all of us kind of on the same page in August so as staff really starts working through it with, um, the various department heads and then coming through city manager's office and finance department and putting all the pieces together and what funds and levy amounts, et cetera. So it's a, it's a lot of a lot of work. And I, I feel like as a council, we really committed to doing a good job in that and really trying to think ahead about, you know, what were some of the issues um, potentially that we wanted to see some, you know, m more than minor changes um, to the budget and make sure that we, tran you know, that we transmitted that information to staff in August. As I've had conversations with people, I think it's, you know, it's clear that, you know, we all come at this with different perspectives, different priorities, um, as we look at the budget and things that we want to see accomplished. Um, I'm, I'm proud to see that we've been able to lower the tax levy. I think this is our eighth year in a row. Um, and I think as Jeff said in his transmittal letter, it's probably only one or two more years maybe, you know, that we might be doing that. And that's probably reasonable. Um, I don't think we want to go to uh, the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, um, but I think we want to get a little more competitive maybe than we have been in, in our local area. Um, so I think may maybe we can do that for another couple of years and maybe not and then, levy and then level off. What's been my biggest quandary for the last couple of weeks um, 
has been basically what happened when I was gone. Um, I missed a meeting, so I was at a convention. I talked to three council members <clears throat> as I was sitting in O'Hare Airport about the aid to agencies money. And I had read carefully the uh, minutes of the neighborhood uh, development group. Was it? Neighbor NC, you know, HCDC. HCDC, Housing and Community Development, I, all these different acronyms we have. Um, had, had read through that carefully and was, was disappointed in that group in that they had been given a budget. Um, I think many people in that group were ready to approve it, um, but still come back and ask us for more money. I think staff had done a, done a good job of recommending, I think it was an extra $37,000 to fund uh, some of the emerging organizations. And what I said to the three council members that I talked to on the phone was, I encourage that we do that and that I strongly encourage that we look at setting a work session for later this spring or early summer to talk in depth about how we fund aid to agencies in the future, how we can make sure that we're doing it in a sustainable manner, how we can try to build in um, annual increases, which I do believe the city manager had put in, in his memo. Um, and making sure that you know that they're not losing um, the opportunity for grant funding, which has become a concern, um, but that to all of a sudden, at the very last minute, drop an extra two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars that we weren't planning to didn't seem responsible to me. Um, these aid ag these agencies were not. They were not expecting that 250000 They, um, They obviously always want more. I get that. They need more. But I think also the city manager had done a great job in trying to communicate to us and, and the community in general uh, how much more money we actually give to a lot of these agencies and other programs in the community. So my disappointment was, was with HCDC in their approach in refusing to make an allocation. Um, and then my second disappointment after all three council members that I had talked to agreed that that was a reasonable approach was to um, approve the extra $37,000, have work sessions in the spring and figure out how to, you know, increase these numbers in the future. Um, two of the three uh, went with the majority and we dropped an extra $250,000 at the last minute into the budget. For me, this is a process issue, it is, it, we have tough decisions to make. And it's, it's being strong enough to make those tough decisions regardless of what comes up in front of us. This was not an emergency. If it had been an absolute emergency, I would entirely agree that somehow we find that money in our budget and we have reserves. But my concern is the approach. Um, so I have struggled for the last couple of weeks to decide how I would vote. Um, I'm going to support the budget, but I just felt I had to speak out very strongly um, about my disappointment and frustration um, in terms of how the process worked. So I'd like to respond to that. Um, it is too bad you couldn't go to the meeting because you and I did talk. I was one of the three. I think you made some very compelling points. But what really struck me about that particular aid to agency meeting, and I think it would have appealed to you in terms of the numbers and the logic, is I felt the members of those commission made a very compelling data-driven case based upon the increase in population that we have and that funding had not kept up over time. And maybe you wouldn't have been persuaded had you been here. Um, but I think, to me, that is citizen-led government. That is co collaboration with our residents and with our commissions. In my view, during that process, they made, and, 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 and what was, who was most compelling, and I forget her name, but the, the chair of the commission, if someone could help me, she gave not an impassioned speech. She gave a very um, fact-driven. Paula Vaughn. Paula Vaughn. 
and it was just the facts. It was without emotion, and it was very compelling. And so I think, to me, we come into this chamber with a pre-existing set of views, but when people make their case, and I think it wasn't just her, it wasn't just Charlie Eastham, it wasn't just Vanessa, to ignore that, and I said at the time, I said the um, you know the easy thing to do is to agree with them, right, and to make that, and the hard thing to do is to say no, as, as you did, so you should be commended with that. Um, but I think they did make their case, and so maybe if you could, you read the minutes, but if you could actually see the presentation, maybe you wouldn't be I persuaded. Have. You actually saw it? You did, you did see Washington. it? Okay, well, I was very persuaded. She was a couple streets down, and so I think if we're going to err on the side of the community members in need and make some possibly mistakes, as you may indicate, that we should do it in this way with our aid to agencies, organizations that do such terrific work. And we did make clear to assuage any concerns going forward that this was not going to be an ongoing thing. Now we'll see what happens next year, uh, but in this particular instance, I think they made their case for that. But setting aside this issue, I'm really proud of the way that we've balanced the, the need for economic growth. I'm very proud of the fact that we've maintained our AAA bond rating, that our reserves are strong, we're able to get a reduction in the levy, while at the same time increasing the um, spending uh, for our residents truly in need. So I'm very proud of this budget, and I'm proud to support it. But I think you, do, you raise some valid concerns, Susan. <clears throat> Any further discussion? This was my first opportunity to go through the budget process, and as Dennis was given um, a piece that I wasn't expecting tonight, which was um, additional funds that came in and uh, things that went out and all that other stuff. At the end of that, I wanted to know what is like the bottom number. Um, <laughs> hopefully, is a positive number, but because um, I'm sure we can find a way to spend that. Um, other than that, I, I want to thank the staff for making a very um, I don't know, elementary for me? <laughs> to understand the budget to the best of my ability. Um, it is massive, it really is. There's a lot that goes into uh, this budget. Um, I learned a lot um, and you know, I appreciate your comments, Susan. I, I honestly do. I honestly do, because what I'm learning is, uh, uh, you know, a budget is a budget, and. Um, Sometimes, yes, we, we, we will be compelled to um, yeah. make adjustments and stuff like that, but um, I, I do appreciate your comments. I can expound upon my thoughts about it. Um, I, I really think we could compromise with uh, HCDC because they, they seem like they would compromise. But nevertheless, uh, a decision was made. But I really appreciate the city staff for the process, and I'm looking forward to the next budget season. Believe it or not. <laughs> They're ready for a break. <laughs> Pauline, do you have things you want to say? Well, I do appreciate Susan's comments because when when I went into the process, I, I like her, was all disappointed uh, in, in the commission for sort of dropping in a lap. But as Dr. said, uh, when Paula gave the presentation and hearing the facts about how it's been kind of stagnant uh, several years, uh, at the same time costs are going up and the need is going up and the number of agencies is going up, uh, I, I, like Rockney, uh decided that uh, uh, we really did need to uh, give that extra money. And, and as he also pointed out, it, 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 uh, uh, it, it isn't going to be a recurring thing. We're going to have to continue to look at this and something we need to look at. It is what our allocation is going to be. Thank you. Thank you. John, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, the, I'd not forgotten, but had not anticipated this uh, question of the aid to agencies, but it, it was a, um, it was an interesting experience. I mean, you know, I think all of us, certainly myself, saw this as this, you know, the, the going into that discussion that this was a significant increase. As, as Rockney said, it was a very compelling, um, passionate but grounded presentation in terms of the, um, you know, the request. And I, you know, I, what I said at the time was that, and Susan, you mentioned if this were an emergency. Well, you know, these are agencies which are, are frontline agencies with respect to services to people that are the most vulnerable in our community. So I think, uh, you know, I think legitimately it could be considered to be um, a, 
a very pressing issue, if not an emergency. We did acknowledge it was a one-year, um, you know, a decision that only pertained to the one year, and that, as you had mentioned, we we needed to resolve this issue so we could address it as we move forward. Um, but it did seem at the time, and it was also, you know, an, an appropriate decision on our part. And hearing how the HDDC themselves had kind of a breakthrough at their meeting, you know, where they just reached an impasse and said, we just can't submit what, you know, uh, base our submittal or requests on the budget we were given. Um, so in any event, I, you know, I think it was a one-time decision that revealed the fact that, that the whole funding for the aid agencies needed to be evaluated. Okay, well, I'm going to support the budget um, motion, but I want to thank Dennis, and in particular, Jacqueline Fuegel, for the great work you've done in putting this budget together. Uh, of course, a lot of staff was involved as well, not just the two of you, but thanks so much for what you've done. It's a big task, and you've done it well yet again. Okay, I think, uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Mims, second by Thomas. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right, item 20. Three-year financial plan and five-year capital improvement plan. This is a resolution approving the three-year financial plan for the city of Iowa City, Iowa, and the five-year capital improvement plan. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Mims, seconded by Thomas. Discussion? Full sail ahead. <laughs> no, I just wish we had a few hundred more million for our <laughs> capital improvement plan. Well, I wish we had a few hundred more million for potholes. Hmm. I mean, I, I want to. I'm joking about that, but of course, we do have a really severe pothole problem this late winter. Uh, it, it's really beyond the pale relative to previous years that I've been here, and uh, I think it'd be good uh, for staff to give us some feedback about how it's going to respond to the potholes in terms of getting them filled as quickly as possible and that kind of thing. Maybe some brief memo to. Dependent on weather. Yeah, I know. We can't just go out there in a snowstorm or something like that and try to fill potholes, but it's can, not a trivial problem. We can give you an overview of how we approach it and um, how that changes throughout the year. So we, we'll do that. Let's put a memo in your info packet. Yeah, you can't drive 35 mile an hour on Park Road, I'll tell you that. Sure. Going up the top of the hill, bam, you're in a sea of potholes. Speed limit's 25. You want to slow traffic down. Yeah, mm -hmm. why, why do I do it? call it our traffic comment. That's right, program. I better not do it at 35 <laughs> miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we need a, a roll call on this, don't we? I think the road Teague? Is dead. Yes. Thomas? Yes. Thrive Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Motion carries six to zero. Item 21, First Avenue Water Main. This is a resolution approving project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the First Avenue Water Main replacement construction project, establishing amount of bid security to accompany each bid, directing city clerk to post notice to bidders, and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'll open the public hearing. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Joe Walter from Engineering to do a staff presentation, if I can figure Good out. Good patience, that. Joe. You've been there <laughs> for a while. I heard it's a virtue. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is located uh, near two landmarks in Iowa City, City High School and um, our Redeemer Lutheran Church. Uh, being kitty corner to the project. We're replacing approximately 1,000 uh, feet of uh, 1950s existing pipe, which has had a history of main breaks. That's on the west side of First Avenue. <clears throat> replacing that with eight inch PVC pipe. 
Um, there also be a crossing across Court Street. There's a piece of pipe on the north side of Court Street um, and a piece of pipe on the south side of Court Street that are intending to be connected and we're gonna put in a new um, valve and a new vault there to house that vault. Uh, the crossing on Court Street uh, will be eight inch and 12 inch pipe. Trenchless methods are being used to minimize disturbances. There will be several boring pits between the different uh, um, jack and bore or directional drilling. And uh, that's to minimize the amount of disturbances. There will still be some excavations to restore service connections to the individual houses and uh, customers along those lines. The, we're uh, hoping to open bids on April uh, 8th. Uh, we would like construction to start after the school year ends, when, whenever that is, uh, <laughs> up in the air, I think, still. Uh, and then hoping to get uh, substantially completed before the school year starts, uh, being so close to City High School there uh, that we thought that was very important. Uh, obviously, there's some odds and ends with every project, so we'd have a final completion date uh, later in the fall. The uh, estimated opinion of cost is $375,000. And... Um, there's my contact, and the design engineer is Brad Roth out of Muscatine with Watersmith Engineering. Great. Thanks, Joe. Any questions for Joe? Nope. Thanks. Anyone else want to address this topic? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Move the resolution. Second. Moved by Mim, seconded by Thomas. Discussion. I'm glad to hear you're going to avoid or try to avoid the school year. Yes, indeed. Good thinking, Joe. <laughs> <coughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Rob Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teak? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 22, animal services. This is an ordinance amending Title III entitled Finances, Taxation, and Fees. Chapter 4 entitled Schedule of Fees, Rates, Charges, Bonds, Fines, and Penalties. And Title VIII entitled Police Regulations. Chapter 4 entitled Animal Services. To clarify recently enacted animal services provisions and to change the amount of the scheduled fines for certain animal services violations. This is second consideration, but staff has requested expedited action. I move the rule requiring the ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. We've got six. Moved by a mem. Second. Second. Second by Taylor. <laughs> Discussion. <laughs> Hearing none, roll call, please. Throg Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Move final adoption at this time. Second. Moved by Mem, second by Thomas. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throckmorton? Yes. Motion carries 6 to 0. Item 23, Community Police Review Board Amendments. This is an ordinance amending Title 8 Police Regulations, Chapter 8, Community Police Review Board, to provide for changes in procedure and enhance opportunities for conversation when the conclusions of the police chief and the board differ. Could I have a motion to pass and adopt, please? So moved. Moved by Teague. Second. Second by Thomas. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Frog Martin? Yes. Cole? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 24, Moss Ridge TIF Ordinance. This is an ordinance providing that general property taxes levied and collected each year 
on certain property located within the Moss Ridge Urban Renewal Area in the City of Iowa City, County of Johnson, State of Iowa, by and for the benefit of the State of Iowa, City of Iowa City, County of Johnson, Iowa City Community School District, and other taxing districts, be paid to a special fund for payment of principal and interest on loans, rebates, grants, monies advanced to and indebtedness, including bonds issued or to be issued, incurred by city, sorry, incurred by said city in connection with the Moss Ridge Urban Renewal Plan. Could I have a motion to pass and adopt, please? So move. Second. Moved by Teague, second by Cole. <clears throat> Discussion. Hearing none, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 25, electric assist bicycles. <clears throat> this is an ordinance amending Title IX entitled Motor Vehicles and Traffic, Chapter 1 entitled Definitions, Administration and Enforcement of Traffic Provisions, and Chapter 8 entitled Bicycles to provide for the operation of electric assist bicycles. Could I have a motion for first consideration, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Teague, seconded by Cole. Discussion. Anybody on staff want to say anything about this? I think it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, um, this uh, relates to our upcoming bike share. So maybe, Darian, do you want to come up and just update council where we're at with the bike share? Sure. Hi there. Darian Nagelgam, Transportation. Hi, Darian. Uh, services. So this is uh, an ordinance is, which is going to define more clearly in our code to allow for electric assist bikes. And why we needed to define that more clearly is because these bicycles operate a little bit differently. Many of our bike share companies have um, electric assist bikes, which give you a little bit of a power assist uh, in proportion to how hard you push down on the pedal, as opposed to an electric assist bike that has sort of a throttle and you can set it and you just kind of go without pedaling. So we just need to make sure that our code um, is is caught up so that when we implement a bike share, many of them have these electric assist bikes that they would be enabled. And they're also getting more popular. You could go into any one of the local bike shops and you could pick up an electric assist bike. So they help you get up hills a little bit easier. They help you, they give you a little, basically it makes you a fitter version of yourself. Um, what they do. So uh, we think they'll be popular. We just needed to make sure that the code reflected and allowed for their operation where normal bicycles would operate. Mm-hmm. Scooters are also a hot topic lately. This has nothing to do with scooters, correct? This, yeah, this is specifically just for electric assist bicycles. And that will be on the horizon of the future. Correct. Okay. Yep. I love it. We do too. Fitter versions of ourselves. That's not a bad concept. All hope. Thank you, Darian. Yes, no problem. Any further discussion on the part of council? Well, I, I'm pleased to see as as we expand the bike network that we're diversifying ways of using the bike lanes um, so that they will be more popular, better better used. And then, as Rockney said, you know, here come the scooters. I mean, they're the next wave. And so I'm, I'm really seeing that bike network, um, you know, the potential of it will be realized as we diversify these options. All right. Okay, hearing no further discussion, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 26, repeal dance permit. An ordinance, this is an ordinance repealing Title IV, Alcoholic Beverages, Chapter 4, Dancing Regulations, Section 1, Dancing Restricted in Connection with Business, and Chapter 3, Outdoor Service Areas, Seasonal, 5-Day or 14-Day Licenses and Permits, Section 4, Perrin 1, L. Perrin L, Regarding Dancing of the City Code. Could I have a motion to give first consideration, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Teague and seconded by Cole. Discussion? Getting rid of the dancing permits. What, mm. nobody going to be able to permit or, or dance around here? We were like mm. footloose before, huh? Yeah, what happened to the better vision, uh, the, the fitter versions of ourselves? <laughs> you can still dance. I guess. <laughs> John will take it after this. Okay, enough uh, joking <laughs> around, Jim. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? 
Yes. Motion carries six to zero. Item 27, Woodland Ridge Water Agreement. This is a resolution authorizing the mayor to sign and the city clerk to attest an agreement to provide water service to Woodland Ridge subdivision. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So move. Second. Moved by Teague, seconded by Thomas. Discussion? Ron. Good evening. Uh, Ron Kanucky, Public Works Director. Um, in 2017, uh, we approved an agreement with Lucina Meadows uh, to provide water to them. Um, at that time, uh, it mentioned another subdivision that was in the neighborhood uh, that was having the same issue of radionuclides in their water wells. Um, at that time, uh, Woodland Ridge was preparing their preliminary engineering report um, and submitting that to the DNR um, to um, apply for some uh, state revolving funds to be able to put water main in and, and to come onto our city system. Um, the state uh, approved that report in 2018, uh, and they've been preparing plans uh, to move forward with uh, installing water main and connecting to uh, those Sienna Meadows uh, water main. Um, this agreement basically is identical agreement to what we have with the Sienna Meadows. Um, the caveat on this one is that we have to get to the Sienna Meadows uh, subdivision water main approved and accepted uh, prior to them being able to connect onto it, uh, which we expect that to happen this spring with some uh, punch list work that they have to do on that project. Um, the expectation is that they would be on our system and we'd be providing water to them either by this fall or by next spring. Okay. Any questions for Ron? Uh, I'm going to throw you a big softball. Uh, so that my question is has to do with the equivalent of mission creep, you know that concept, mission creep? Okay, yes. <laughs> Where the, the yep. mission keeps expanding sure. beyond what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, reassure me this is not a version of development creep. In other words, providing water, maybe sewers next, maybe whatever, you know. So as we as we analyze these situations that come up, you know, we, we have established three criteria for um, providing services outside of our corporate boundaries. Um, the first criteria is that they're not within our growth boundary. Uh, the second criteria is that there's a public health issue. And the third criteria is that it will not have an impact on our system. And in this case, uh, it, it meets all those criteria. Um, if we have a situation where we would have a, a a subdivision that was within our growth boundaries and was looking to uh, hook onto our, our system, we would require annexation. Um, so you know, it, 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 the, the big thing here is I think the public health issue that, that this does raise and um, we have the ability to provide water to them. Um, the, the vice of this is if a rural water system would, would try to start um, getting closer to Iowa City, it would make it more difficult for us to, ex to expand uh, in the future. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, council discussion. Hi, uh, Ms. Paul Bain. Uh, as, uh, with my healthcare background, I think with the previous subdivision, I mentioned this also, uh, it definitely is a public health issue, and uh, it's very important that we assure the health and safety of all, all of our community. So I'm very much in favor of this. Great. Thanks, Pauline. Any other council comments? No, I would just piggyback on the question you asked, Jim, that I think we had discussed that, and I, that was certainly one of my questions when we did the one for Lucina Meadows is, you know, where does this end? Mm -hmm. um, you know, regardless of health issues, we aren't responsible for providing clean, safe drinking water to everybody in Johnson County. So making sure that we know what those parameters are, I think is really important, so. Yeah, I would share that. I mean, sort of putting on our strong towns hat, what are the long-term liabilities that we are incurring by reason of this? And does the rate of 1.5 times the fee adequately ensure that we'll be able to meet those long-term liabilities? But that said, mm -hmm. I think with the health issue, um, it does not appear to be mission creep. Um, I'll support it. Mm -hmm. Legitimate concern though, Jim. Yeah. Any further comment? I'm happy they're paying for the in infrastructure of it also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no way we do it otherwise. Okay. Hearing no more discussion, roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion carries 6 to 0. Item 28. 28A, Housing and Community Development Commission. We have one vacancy to fill an unexpired 
plus three-year term upon appointment. Uh, there's a, a male gender balance requirement. <laughs> Uh, five people have applied, three of them are men to women. So, uh, Joe Coulter, Matt Drabeck, and Peter Incomo. Do you folks have preference about who to appoint? I would say either Matt or Peter. I, I don't personally know either one of them. Um, Peter called me. I, Joe obviously is, an, is a is a great representative, but we've talked about trying to give new people an opportunity, and Joe has served on a number of Iowa City commissions in the past. So I feel very strongly that it needs to be um, either Matt or Peter, but I don't have a strong opinion. I don't know either one of them personally. Well, I've had conversations with Peter as president of the Congolese community, and you know, I, I, you know, he'd be a good appointee. And I would support uh, that. He he did give me a call or an email. I forget which it was. So I would support Peter. But I, I don't know what other people think I, either. So I, Peter. I would support Peter. Okay. I think it's great to get some representation from the Congolese community too. Okay. Yeah, this is Pauline. That, it was kind of a tough decision because Joe has been an excellent representative on, on uh, some of our commissions, uh, excellent attendance at, at all the meetings and coming and accepting um, re uh, items on at the council and attending other meetings. I've seen him in other meetings. Um, but yeah, we, we have had set a precedent that we'd like to get new folks, and I would be supportive of Peter. Okie doke. We can combine the, this with the, the next one, right, to do motions. Okay. So item 28B, Telecommunications Commission. We have one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment. There's a female gender balance requirement, and we have applications from two individuals, one a male, one a female, uh, Andrew Austin and Gina Reyes. So... I mean, it seems pretty obvious what to do here, and Gina seems to have pretty substantial background, so I would recommend appointing her to the Telecommunications Commission. I would agree. I'd concur. Fine with me. I, I, oh. What's that, Pauline? That, that sounds, no. oh, I was going to say, um, I agree, obviously, it's obvious, but I, I would like to encourage Andrew. Uh, it looks like there are two terms expiring next year, which would be a male uh, for male position, and I would encourage him to apply again. An 18 year old, I'm excited that someone that young is interested in, in doing this kind of public service. Good point. I do have a question. Do the applicate, applicants remain if. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On file. Yeah, they do for a year from the time that it's submitted. So and it's his within that year period I of the anticipated expired, or we don't know. Expiration in June. Um, I guess it would depend on when it gets announced and when it was actually submitted. Okay. So. <clears throat> Okay, so I think we have two decisions there. Could I have a motion to appoint Peter Nkumu to the Housing and Community Development Commission and Gina Reyes to the Telecommunications Commission? So moved. Second. Moved by Cole, second by Mims. <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. That, that was in favor, I know, Pauline. Thank you. So yeah. mo motion carries. All right, item 29, announcement of vacancies, previous announcements. Applicants for these positions must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. We have two vacancies to fill five-year terms on the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a three-year term for the East College Street position on the Historic Preservation Commission, and one vacancy to fill a three-year term for the Jefferson Street District in the, on the Historic Preservation Commission. Vacancies will remain open until filled. All right, item 30, community comment. Gustav, you want to speak up? And anyone else who would like to address the topic could probably do that, but nobody's here. <laughs> Hi, um, Gustav Stewart, student liaison. Um, I wanted to mention two uh, kind of university happenings that um, I figured it's worth mentioning. First off, um, that currently there are plans to put uh, a student garden um, right by North Hall in the river, if you know that green space over there. I'm moving it from um, where it currently is at, where it's close by West High School, um, to convert it there. Um, it was previously talked about a few years ago, but then funding um, fell through, and I 
think they're plan they secured funding to put um, a garden more in that area. So if we're thinking about community gardens, um, it'll be close to downtown. It'll um, I'm sure everybody can use it and whatnot, but that'll be um, coming up in the next couple years. So that's something yeah, super exciting. Good. That's great. Um, and the second thing was, um, I'm not sure if you're, um, you remember from last year uh, that um, we're currently uh, using fundraising for the Hawkeye Completion Grant, um, which the Hawkeye Completion Grant is essentially um, if you have a fees um, $100 to $1,000 um, on your um, university bill, and you aren't allowed to register for next semester's classes, right? So currently we're um, creating, <coughs> we did this last year, um, but we're fundraising um, again uh, to, um, I think the goal is $5,000 dollars at least what we're trying to um, garner for um, funds um, and I think there's additional funds elsewhere but um, to kind of if an individual is um, currently in that situation and they don't have the sufficient funds that you would be you would ha have those funds available um, a small uh, grant per se. So I wanted to extend um, the offer to you uh, to donate um, and I can send you the link. Uh, um, yeah. Anyways. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. All right. Item 31, City Council information. So maybe we could start with Bruce and move to the right. All right. Well, um, we haven't met for some time. <laughs> yeah, got a long list, huh? <laughs> Not exactly. Um, actually, I was able to attend um, through my eyes that was held here in the um, city hall, mm -hmm. and it's it was a film that spotlight for individuals with disabilities and for without who spent some time. Um, learning what it was like to have disabilities. And so um, within the film, it was someone um, that was without sight. And um, actually, Simon was uh, the guinea pig, I guess, that um, experienced life without sight. There was one individual um, where uh, they didn't have the ability to talk. So um, they communicated through um, text, through writing. And and so that was um, uh, an experience that someone had the ability, had to role play, not being able to um, communicate through voice, but through texting and writing. And so, and there were some more things that um, um, happened in that video. One, one thing that I appreciated was actually seeing, um, really having that communication after the film to discuss um, with some of the role players as well as some of the, um, an individual that was a part of the production of this. And, and really um, get a sense of what it is to live with a disability. And so I, I really did appreciate that um, opportunity. And I think it's something that others should try to um, watch when they get a chance. Um, other than that, um, I, I did a couple uh, Johnson County Livable Communities. Um, um, events. One was a, well, not events, but meetings. One was uh, sur uh, surrounding caregiver, and a caregiver action team, and the other one was the task force on aging. Um, and then today I got an opportunity to go to the University of Iowa uh, Faculty Senate, uh, which was held in the old Capitol Mall. And um, I, I'll tell you, there are some passionate people. Um, the topic for me was about affordable housing um, relating to the college students. And so there were some passionate people about there, uh, there um, that really will you know, like to be at the table, it was my impression, to discuss the needs of the students and um, the need for affordable housing, especially with a lot of the new uh, buildings going up where there will be high density. Um, you know, they just thought that they would, uh, some express wanting to be at the table to voice their opinion, and I told them they could always reach out to us. So, um, yeah, that's what I have to report. Thanks for doing that. 
And Bruce, you were there because I had a conflict in my schedule, and so you were gracious enough to cover for me, so I very much appreciate that. Um, and I guess not necessarily an exchange, but you were all, I know you were sick last Thursday, and the reason why I know that is because I covered for you yes. um, to speak with an absolutely delightful group of students called the Roosevelt Group, which I had never heard of, um, but evidently right now on the University of Iowa campus, there is a group of students that are actually funded by the Roosevelt family, like as in the Roosevelt family. And I found that fascinating. Like I should have known that before because FDR, of course, and Eleanor, of course, is one of my um, heroes. Uh, and so it's a delightful group of students, probably about 20, that wanted to engage in a discussion on policy. And so Senator Bolcom was there, um, Professor Tolbert, and also the head of NextGen. And we had a great discussion about the future of college education, keeping college affordable. Um, and I, I think the students were actually interested too so which is always thrilling that I don't think there were too many sleepy eyes there it was a great discussion great opportunity and I think to your point Bruce um, we, we really do, do need to do more um, to the extent we can with the, the collaboration with the University of Iowa with our with our terrific students it was a real um, terrific opportunity and it's great to see that the legacy of FDR is, is carried on and Eleanor Roosevelt on, on our campus so that was very that was very wonderful um, I do briefly want to comment on something that none of us could be at tonight. Uh, Jim, you briefly mentioned that in your opening. Of course, um, I'm referred to the Church of Nazarene. Um, they received some uh, Nazi gra graffiti, uh, swastikas were placed on their church. And I know everyone at this table cannot strongly condemn enough and that we will do everything in our power to, to stand up to the bullies that intimidate our residents that belong here and will always belong in the city of Iowa City, no matter what. We will always stand with those residents, no matter what, and they will always be part of our community. I hope as a council, we keep an eye out for additional events for us to be able to attend, um, because I think it is very important. I would have loved to have been there tonight. Um, we couldn't do that because of our council obligations. Uh, but we really do need to continue to monitor that and to ensure that we're doing everything in our power. And I think the public can be assured that we are doing everything. And I know our police department, our city manager, all of us are doing everything we can to stop this and get to the bottom of it. Because it certainly has been a troubling trend that we've seen at least in my experience in the last one or two years, and, and we need to reverse that um, because it is never acceptable um, as far as that goes, and, and we will do anything possible for those residents. Um, I did want to highlight a future, uh, a, f a few events that residents may want to attend. You know, one woman who I wish I would have known better was Barbara, Barbara um, Schlachter, um, her husband Mel. Um, Barbara was one of the founding members of 100 Grannies. And what I love about Barbara and also the 100 Grannies is they are a group of action. They get things done, they move, as they say, they educate and they agitate. And that includes occasionally grannies get in trouble sometimes. But they do for a good cause. Um, so Monday, March 18th and March 25th from, uh, and March 25th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., there will be a lecture, lecture celebrating Barbara Schlachter and her legacy. Um, it will be done by, and it will be at the Iowa City Senior Center in room 202. Um, and the lecture will be by um, Peter Rolnick. Uh, he will talk about climate change, which I know is an issue that we all uh, care about. And it's free uh, to the public, and I encourage you to attend. Um, Another organization that I absolutely love is the um, Baroque Land Trust, uh, one of these quiet nonprofits that does a tremendous amount of good work um, in saving uh, land and administering and doing a lot of great work in forestry. Uh, they're gonna hold a fundraiser uh, March 13th, I guess that's tomorrow, um, at Short's East Side Burgers, one of my favorite places, and 15% of those profits will go and be donated to the um, Baroque Land Trust, and that's on Westbury Drive from 5 to 9 p.m. Everyone. Can and go, you just gotta be hungry and, and love their terrific burgers. And finally, um, there is a physics and astronomy demonstration show, March 15th, Van Allen Hall. Uh, this year's theme is Natures and Rhythms, um, the ways in which Mother Nature produces periodic motion and rhythm. Uh, my daughter loves all the science events on campus, and so I think if you got any kids out there, the university always does a terrific job. And that's gonna take place March 15th, um, presented by the Van Allen Observatories, 30 North Dubuque Street from seven to eight p.m. and it is free, so it doesn't get better than that. Great.
Well, I've been sort of under the weather for a while. <laughs> so, and then there's the endless winter. Um, hmm. So all these things in my calendar are just sort of passing me by. But I, I did make it to the um, Prairie Hill this past weekend, had its first year of uh, celebrating its occupancy of the site. And, um, you know, I've always, I mention Prairie Hill from time to time because I, I think it's such a great example of uh, new development, which is, is a really, I think, good example of what I've been referring to as sociable design, as well as integrating varying housing types uh, in a way that's done, I, I would say, very coherently. And they're at about 50% occupancy, so the, the project is beginning to flesh out. Um, so I think it's worth a visit, maybe not now. It's a little, a little mucky out there, but uh, come spring. And it's an interesting group of folks. They're always happy to engage. Uh, their common house, I think, which is an interesting use of their, uh, their common house is that it served as a polling place uh, in, the, in a recent election. So it, it's actually provided a, uh, a space, which I think is, again, some, one, one of the issues we face in Iowa City is where can people gather throughout town? And in this case, you know, Miller Orchard, I would say, is probably lacking in that regard. So, so the Prairie Hill is, with the Common House, provided a place for that to happen. Very good. Um, yeah, it's been three weeks since we've had a meeting, but uh, like John said, with the weather and mm -hmm. with a full-time job, um, I've just been kind of keeping pretty busy just doing that stuff. So, and we'll talk about uh, other committee assignments later. So, I haven't really. Other than Rockney, did you see the article in the paper about uh, the Burr Oak Land Trust and they're bringing in a dog that can smell out turtles? Well, I did not see that. Doesn't surprise me though. They do a lot of good things. <laughs> thought that was pretty interesting. Auction. The dog failed to be a drug dog. Oh, okay. It was too, you know, too, no, it's too active, I guess. And so. Sounds like my dog. So, mm. yeah, they, so they're using it to find the little painted turtles. Good stuff. Very good. Pauline, your turn. <clears throat> uh, just a couple things that have gone on recently. Uh, March 2nd was the Crisis Center annual pancake breakfast, which was wonderful as usual at the Our Redeemer Lutheran Church. Uh, I know there was a good crowd because my daughter at noon was noted to be the 900th person in attendance, so I'm sure they uh, hit close to the 1,000 person level, which is, which is good. Uh, congrats to them. Uh, and then the next day was uh, the Soul Food Dinner at the Robert A. Lee Smith Center. Again, there was a large turnout there, uh, as well as some great food, and it was a, it was great to see such a, a diverse group of an, attendees. So, uh, looking forward to another one next year. That's all. Very good. Well, I've uh, had the opportunity to participate in several quite diverse events, and I want to mention some of them. Uh, like uh, on the 21st of February, I attended a terrific event at Hatcher, uh, We Shall Overcome, a celebration of doc Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. featuring Damian Sneed. That was quite the thing. On the 25th, I attended the uh, Crisis Center's big reveal about its new name, Community. On the 26th, I attended the Refugee Alliance's monthly meeting and heard the manager of the new Drury Hotel in Coralville describe what they're doing. On the 27th, I intended, attended the Corps of Engineers public information meeting about their plans for updating the management plan for the dam and reservoir. And I can tell you that I found that to be pretty darn interesting. And I was especially struck by and asked a lot of questions about the data they showed concerning the long-term trends in annual precipitation and extreme precipitation events. It's striking. I mean, if I... You know, if you know what this means, if you look at a graph and, and the line's doing that, that means there's an upward trend. So there's a, a clear straight line upward trend. Of course, the data bounces around, but it's an upward trend in the annual precipitation here and in extreme weather events, except the upward trend, upward trend for extreme weather events is more like that instead of a straight line thing. So that is clearly related to, well, I'd say clearly related to climate change, global climate change affecting us here locally. And um, yeah, and something to take into account when we're looking ahead. 
Also, I had a chance to attend the Solarize Johnson County success story on the 28th. And also on the 28th, I attended the Chamber of Commerce's annual banquet. On the 2nd, I participated in Community's annual pancake breakfast, just like Pauline did. On the 3rd, I went to the Black Voices Project's annual soul food dinner. That was great fun. I had some fried chicken. I thought maybe I was back in Kentucky again. And oh, and this time it was in honor of Kurt Fries. And uh, uh, Royce Ann made a real clear point about that, and it's very an admirable thing for them to do. On the 7th, I went to a uh, University of Iowa Creative Matters discussion involving two very impressive operatic singers. Listen up, Bruce. I'm listening. Yeah, Lawrence Brownlee and Eric Owens. They were fabulous. And the next night, I attended a brilliant performance by them out at Hancher. Oh, they're just stunning. So, and et cetera. But uh, that's, uh, the, the range and diversity of stuff mm -hmm. is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, Jeff. You want to do turn. the legislative update now yeah, or work session? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, it doesn't matter, does it? So let's do it okay. now because it'd be televised. And it's yep. Simon, the mayor maybe. had asked us to do a quick legislative update, so Simon, uh, as you know, is our point person for that. And he's going to walk you through a few key bills. Great. Sure. Uh, I'll start with a couple of notes about the timeline. So the first uh, legislative funnel passed uh, last Friday, and by that date, all uh, new legislation has to be reported out of committee within the originating chamber. Uh, the next funnel date is April 5th, and bills must be reported out of the other chamber's committee at that point. Uh, there are a number of bills that aren't subject to funnels, and that includes appropriations, ways and means bills, uh, tax law. So we'll expect to see more of that later on in the session. Uh, first one I'm going to address is uh, rental permit caps. Uh, so this is the one that's uh, dominated our time uh, most uh, thus far in the session. Um, this would uh, remove our ability to, uh, to place uh, caps on rental permits in neighborhoods. You'll remember after uh, the state passed the residential occupancy bill a couple of years ago uh, that this was our next best solution. Uh, and uh, part of that solution was also an increased enforcement on uh, uh, code violations, and so uh, that's related to the complaint you heard tonight. Um, and as each of these tools are removed from our toolbox, uh, I think that you'll see that the uh, next best solution is a little bit worse and has a little bit more unintended consequences. So this is one we take very seriously. Uh, we don't want to see it pass, but it does appear to have a great deal of momentum. Uh, it passed the Senate yesterday on a vote of 35 to 11. Uh, just today, it was introduced in the House and renumbered, um, and we'll be eligible for debate in the House on Friday. Uh, so it is moving uh, pretty quickly. Um, we uh, did meet with the Iowa City Area Realtors uh, group today. Uh, they're the ones that are uh, pushing into Des Moines. Uh, realtors from uh, both Iowa City and Ames uh, it has been added to their statewide legislative priority list. Uh, Senator Bolcom yesterday, as it was being debated on the floor of the Senate, did speak uh, on our behalf and did a very good job. Uh, so. Um, um, again, we don't want to add additional layers of, regu of regulation with uh, additional unintended consequences. Uh, so our goal right now is hopefully that we can work with the local realtors to find uh, an agreeable solution, at least in the near term uh, here locally, and hold off on state legislation for at least a year. Um, so the, the state legislature works in uh, two-year sessions, and this is the first year of that. So this bill, should they wait a year, uh, would still be funnel-proof next year. Uh, so so our perspective is it's a good idea to take that time to evaluate a compromise or uh, different types of solutions or maybe additional exemptions to the uh, policy and uh, hopefully stave that off. Uh, next one is uh, private electric generation. Uh, uh, this is the one Mayor Throgmorton included in an email in your late handouts. Uh, net metering is a, another name for it. Uh, it does have a couple of new numbers as it moves through. The study bills have become uh, House and Senate files, so House File 669 and Senate File 583. Um, it is something that is supported by uh, the utility companies. Uh, the Mid-American Energy is uh, one of the lead sponsors of the bill. Uh, also supported by 
labor organizations. Uh, the opposition has come from environmental groups and interestingly, uh, the Pork Producers Association. They have a lot of solar installations on their um, the hog confinement uh, operations uh, and they are uh, opposed to this bill. Uh, the Metro Coalition is discussing strategy. A number of cities brought it up on the Metro Coalition uh, uh, conference call this week. Uh, and so uh, we're waiting in the next couple of days to, um, to see how that plays out. Uh, we haven't registered on it as a city, uh, given a solar partnership that with MidAmerican and um, the fact that a couple of labor organizations have uh, registered in support of it. Uh, so it was one that kind of hit both sides of the strategic plan. So we haven't moved on it yet as a city, but uh, expect that the, the Metro Coalition may as those discussions continue. Uh, and please stop me with any questions as I go here. Uh, the next one is uh, electric vehicles. Uh, there is a bill uh, moving uh, faster in the Senate than the House. Uh, it's just got a subcommittee scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, it would require an excise tax on uh, electricity dis dispensed or sold for electric vehicles and would also increase the registration fee for electric vehicles at the state level. It's a long bill. I've been kind of surprised that it hasn't gotten more press. Um, it also deals with uh, um, uh, hydrogen fuel, a, a number of uh, other things that uh, maybe this kind of got buried in it. Um, but uh, we are concerned that this impacts our charging stations in our parking decks or, for instance, high V parking lots. Um, so we're going to work at that angle and hopefully uh, uh, do something to be able to slow that bill down or at least uh, have our charging stations removed from it, uh, given that we don't charge for the electricity there. Um, House Study Bill 165, uh, property tax reform. Uh, so this one we haven't been engaged in much. Uh, we don't expect it to move uh, very quickly uh, given that it is funnel proof as a, a tax policy. Um, and uh, we understand that there will be amendments introduced to this um, uh, very shortly. So uh, we haven't been involved in this. Uh, the Senate has not uh, released their uh, property tax reform bill yet. We expect that one will be more far reaching. And uh, so really kind of wait and see up until that point. Uh, the bill that it is in the House right now um, it, it caps expenditures and ties that growth to index, uh, to a, a Midwestern index. So uh, you'll remember from our budget discussions, our general fund levy is capped at $8.10 per $1,000 of taxable valuation. This would remove that cap, but cap expenditures instead. Uh, so this would hurt Iowa City um, or growing communities more than others uh, in that um, even when we cut our tax rate or the 810 holds uh, steady, as our community grows and valuations increase, our actual tax receipts in dollars goes up. Uh, so this is concerning to us, but again, we expect uh, a number of changes going forward, so it probably won't look as it does in its current form. Um, there was one that I mentioned the last time I gave you an update on pre-existing non-conforming uses. Uh, so this was pushed by a, a mobile home uh, lobby. Uh, they had a court case uh, in Des Moines um, that they wanted to see codified into state law. Um, we were concerned that it would have other unintended consequences for us. Uh, this, the House version has been amended to only apply to mobile homes. Uh, the Senate version has not seen that amendment yet, but we expect that going forward. Forward. So I think that we've been uh, successful in um, making that as uh, least impactful to us as possible. Uh, another one that is uh, moving forward in the Senate, uh, became debate eligible today, is the needle exchange program. This is one that was uh, supported by uh, Johnson County's uh, Senate delegation, um, uh, essentially making it uh, uh, safer um, for uh, needles to be um, exchanged, taken off the street. Uh, it's uh, very much supported by public health uh, officials and health care providers. Um, electric scooters uh, is the next bill. That's one that's been uh, uh, heavily debated in uh, the state house. Uh, the house version uh, became eligible for debate on February 27th, but not, has not been uh, debated as of yet. Um, but it is funnel proof in the house. Uh, we successfully added language uh, allowing electric scooters to be re regulated as bicycles, uh, that we could uh, prohibit them on sidewalks or um, you know, other rules that we apply to, uh, to cycling, um, which is really how they were intended uh, to be used. Um, 
there is a bill currently being considered in the Senate that would prohibit um, government agencies, including us, from uh, engaging with a lobbyist to lobby the state government. Uh, this already applies to state agencies, um, but would remove our ability to pay an outside lobbyist to um, lobby the state legislature, and that would include, I believe, the League of Cities, Metro Coalition, other organizations that we are members mm. of. Uh, fireworks legislation uh, continues to move, although it's been a little bit quieter lately. Uh, the Senate bill would remove our ability to limit sales to industrial zones or commercial zones and um, uh, prohibit the use and stop us from prohibiting the use of fireworks on certain dates. Uh, the House bill is more favorable to us and allows for more local control, but the Senate one uh, is moving forward. Um, uh, another bill that uh, the mayor had mentioned in an email was uh, city uh, right of way. Um, uh, cost recovery uh, from utilities that use the right of way. This is the one that um, uh, Mr. Grassley from Mediacom included a letter in your um, packet. Um, that the League, uh, Metro Coalition, and Mediacom are all registered against it. Uh, Des Moines and Dubuque uh, have right of way ordinances where they were, have been able to quantify uh, exact dollar amounts, so they're really taking the lead on uh, opposing that bill. Um, the assessor's bill that we were concerned about early on uh, has a strike through amendment, so um, basically it's a brand new bill. Uh, it would no longer uh, have assessors stand for retention elections, but would rather um, provide penalties for assessors found to have not followed the state appraisal manual. Uh, so th that one, we don't have the same concerns about it that we did previously. Uh, massage therapy bills have also moved in a good direction for us. Uh, there was one that passed the Senate 48 to zero that uh, makes practicing uh, massage therapy without a license a serious misdemeanor. Uh, the League of Cities was also registered in favor of that. And this is my last one. Uh, this one just came across my desk. We haven't interacted uh, on it at all yet, but there is a bill um, relating to the carrying possession or transportation of weapons on school grounds, places of employment, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that there are some restrictions on where those weapons can be and uh, ammunition, but it is on something that would um, you know, change the way that uh, government agencies are, and schools are able to prohibit firearms on their property. So deep breath. Uh, we expect a lot more um, uh, flurry news, of bills <laughs> in the next couple of weeks leading into that second funnel date. And then after that, it becomes mostly uh, tax policy and uh, appropriations, ways and means bills. Thanks for the update, Simon. Thank you. Ashley, or Jeff, I would no. not hear Ashley. So um, just wanted to remind council that uh, you're welcome to attend our uh, Government Alliance on Race and Equity training that's going to be held on March 29th. So I think we've sent you an email about it, but throwing that out there, it's still available to you if you haven't registered. Um, and then also just noting that we're getting very close to choosing a date, place, and time for our first complete count committee for the census in the first week of April. So that's coming. Um, the first week of April is just a year away then from census day. So a lot of work coming up. That's it. Thanks, Ashley. Shaking heads over there. Okay. Looks to me like we're done. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? So move. Second. Move by Teague, second by Cole. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Great.